Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is February 9th, 2022, and the time is 9.31 a.m. And today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. And uh, let's see, there are a couple of different ways to follow the meeting or participate in the public hearing. To both view and participate, I recommend using the Planning Commission Zoom meeting link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone. Please dial 1-669-900-6833 to call in. When prompted, the collaboration code number is 843-2858-7177. Again, this information is posted on the Planning Department webpage if you forget the phone number or have uh, last minute questions on, on um, how to connect. All right, so we have two public hearing items on today's agenda. For each item, time will be provided for members of the public to contribute their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise their hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if calling in by telephone by, remo by remotely raising their, your hand by pressing star nine on your telephone. <clears throat> I will call on participants by either your last name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If you're participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up state your name for the record, and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you'll, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. Members of the public will be provided three minutes to speak. And I will remind everyone of the numbers to press on your phone if you um, forget. We'll take it slow. Also, if, any, if at any time you have difficulty connecting today, to today's meeting via the Zoom link or calling in via telephone, we do have support staff with us today, Michael Lamb, and he will be checking his email periodically. And his name um, is spelled Michael and then dot Lamb, L-A-M, and his email is michael.lamb at santacruzcounty.us. He'll be checking his email periodically, and he's on standby to assist you if you have any issues connecting today. All right, and with those instructions, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the Planning Commission Chair, Tim Gordon. Good morning, Chair Gordon. Good morning. Thank you, Jocelyn, and welcome everyone to the February 9th meeting of Santa Cruz County Planning Commission. Uh, it is 9.34, and we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Could we please have a roll call, Ms. Drake? Um, yes. Commissioner Dan? Here. All right. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. Okay. Commissioner Shepard? Here. Um, Commissioner Schaefer Fritis? Here. Welcome back. And Chair Gordon? Here. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to item number two in our agenda today, additions and corrections to the agenda. Do we have any to discuss, Ms. Tree? Uh, no, no additions or corrections today. Thank you. All right. And item number three, declaration of ex parte communications. Do any commissioners have anything they would like to declare? No. All right. I would mention that I have, <clears throat> excuse me, had a couple conversations with a few members of the public on um, the tiny homes um, uh, item today and just uh, hearing a lot of support and um, that's it. Um, item number four, oral communication. Oh, yes, item, oral communications. Uh, now is the time where we'll hear from members of the public on items that are not on today's agenda. Um, Ms. Drake, do we have anyone that would like to speak? All right, I'll take a look. So again, this is for um, for folks to provide comments 
uh, feedback to the Planning Commission on an item that is not on today's agenda. If you have comments on an item that is on today's agenda, the cannabis amendments or the tiny homes ordinance, um, then you would want to wait until we get to those items. I thought I saw a hand raised a moment ago, but I think it went down. All right, um, Chair, I'm not seeing any. Thank you so much. Okay, so then we'll close oral communications and move on to consent items. Uh, today we have AB 361 resolution, which is you know, continuing the virtual planning commission meetings. And if any commissioners wanted to speak on that, happy to hear comments. Otherwise, uh, a motion could be in order. I move approval. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. I'll second it. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. And uh, all in favor? Say aye. 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 And any opposed? And any dissenting? Okay, that item passes. Thank you. Move on to item, the scheduled, regularly scheduled items now. Um, item number six, the approval of minutes from the January 26th Planning Commission meeting. Would any commissioners like to make a motion on this item or have further discussion? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, is this for the um, item five? We're on item six. Uh, the approval. Yeah, I'll move approval. Thank you. I'm not sure why there was such reticence. <laughs> I'll second it. Thank you so much. And um, uh, scheduled, regular scheduled items. We're doing roll call votes. Could we please have a roll call vote? I'm, I'm a little confused. What? We're on item five or six? Item six is the approval of minutes. The approval of minutes. Okay. Yeah. I, I can't vote um, because I wasn't at the meeting. Abstain. Okay. Sorry, Chair, would you like a roll call, call vote on uh, that? Please, thank you. <laughs> sure. uh, Commissioner Shepard. One what? We're taking a roll call vote on the minutes. Um, oh, sure, yes. Okay. Commissioner Lazenby. Yes. Commissioner Dan. Yes. Um, and Chair Gordon. Yes. And uh, Schaefer Freitas abstain. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That passes. We will move on now to regular scheduled item number seven. This is a public hearing to review and provide a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors on proposed amendments to the cannabis cultivation setbacks in the commercial agricultural zone districts, technical changes associated with minor conflicts in code and associated CEQA notice of exemption. Proposed amendments are to Chapter 13.10.650 of the Santa Cruz County Code. Ms. Drake, do we have a presentation today? Uh, we do. We have Sam Laforty with us today from the Cannabis Licensing Office. Um, Alice, will you please promote uh, Sam Laforty to a panelist or a presenter? Uh, just a moment while we get him set up here. All right. All right. Good morning, Sam. Good morning. I don't know why my camera's not on. I'm going to try to fix that real quick. There we go. All right. Will I have control of the presentation I submitted? Um, no, we usually have uh, CTV staff um, run the PowerPoint. So let's see, will you please load the PowerPoint for this item, item number seven, which is the cannabis cultivation? 
ordinance. And then just say next slide, Sam, when, as you move through it. Okay. Um, well, good morning, planning commissioners. Um, uh, let's move to the next slide here. Okay, I wanted to give a quick review of how we got here. And at the August 24th uh, meeting of the board, the board, a board member identified and elevated community concerns, which led to a motion which included evaluating those concerns around issues between cannabis cultivators in the CA zone um, and residential uses which abut them. Next slide, please. Can I interrupt for a quick second? You didn't allot a few of that. I'm not sure. Yeah. Item two. Um, hold on, Sam. There's some really terrible background noise in the. Um, Melanie, can you mute yourself, please? Huh. Are you still hearing it? Yeah. Let me. Let me see if I can switch to my headset, if that makes a difference. Sounds like there's a vacuum running in the background. That's much better. Did that make any difference? It made all the difference. Thank you, Sam. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, everyone. I don't know what happened there. Um, All right, so um, on October 19th, staff presented the analysis to the board and the board chose to expand setbacks in the CA zone district for outdoor grows from 100 feet to 400 feet. The setback distance for indoor operations was not changed and the setback distance for nurseries was reduced from 100 feet to 50 feet. The board's proposed changes aligned the outdoor cultivation setback distance in the CA zone with the setback distance in the ag zone, the residential ag, special use, TP, C4, and M zones, so that all adjacent uses have CTV staff person had a Wi-Fi connection issue, so she's reconnecting. Um, and as soon as she does, we'll pick right back up again, or maybe we want to restart your slideshow. It's pretty brief. There's only two more slides. <laughs> okay, then we should be able to get through it. Recording in progress. Here's to be a good sign.
One more slide, please. All right. Um, I did want to provide the PC a little bit of background that the setbacks in the CA zone were originally 400 feet and they were reduced to 100 feet for all cultivation activities based on a board motion at the June 2nd, 2020 meeting. Um, next slide. So, um, you know, this item is in front of you today because conflicts between agricultural and residential uses um, are not new or unique to our county. The proposed changes will align the outdoor cultivation setbacks in the CA zone with all other zones which commercial cannabis cultivation is allowed. These changes represent an increase of 300 feet to the existing setback requirements. And that's it. Great, thank you, Mr. Laporte. Appreciate the uh, presentation there. And at uh, this time, I'd like to ask the commissioners if they had any comments or questions um, of staff before we move to public comment. I do have a question, uh, just a brief question for Sam. If you remember the October 19th meeting, uh, I believe that was not a unanimous vote. Is that correct? this recommendation? That is correct. I believe it was a 3-2 vote? Yes. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Okay, let's go ahead and move to the public comment portion of this item. Ms. Drake, can you please open that? Sure. So this is the opportunity for members of the public who wish to speak on this item, the proposed cannabis ordinance amendments, to either raise their hand using the Zoom icon or the um, the, the hand icon on Zoom, or the um, or by pressing star nine on your telephone to remotely raise your hand. So I'm seeing we have some speakers. And um, we'll hear, hear from everyone once. And when I call on your name, you have three minutes to provide comment. So we will start with the last four digits of the phone number being um, 9876. Good morning. And please state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Sarah Broadbent, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today. The recent non-retail cannabis ordinance history is a bit convoluted, so I want to draw your attention to some points. In the August 24th Board of Supervisors meeting, they requested five items, three to be included in a report and two actions, draft a moratorium and draft a noticing and community input process to mirror the retail cannabis requirements. They were unanimous in their vote for these to support these items. In September, the supervisors passed the moratorium on new non-retail cannabis licenses four to one. But then in the October 19th meeting, the board divided and voted three to two to simply return to prior ordinance language rather than to continue the moratorium. The board appeared to be conflicted about this issue and the staff report that day may not have helped. As reported in the Sentinel, and I quote, the staff report read like an advocacy for the industry and did not contain a vein of neutrality in any stretch, said Supervisor Friend, who brought the item forward in August due to the disproportionate impact of adjacent agricultural and residential land in his district. The setback that the other supervisors are speaking of really does nothing to improve the situation within residential areas. The issues have arisen specifically where we allow a license to be secured within a residentially zoned or conflict area, end quote. The issue of setbacks that prompted the original actions in August have not been resolved by this proposal to return to formal, former setbacks. The ability for stakeholders to be noticed and provide input is yet to be addressed. The staff report simply reiterates the board's actions without providing much justification for the proposal and ignores other elements such as the noticing and community input directive. I suggest at this time, the staff be directed to continue research in this matter so that a more complete and substantial proposal can be provided to the Board of Supervisors that actually solves the issues. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. All right, I will go to the next um, speaker who wishes to provide comment today. I'm seeing a name of Vicki Shepard. Good morning, Vicki, will you please restate your name for the record and you have three minutes to speak. My name is Vicki Shepard and I live on, in Watsonville off Crest Drive and I'm here today to talk with you about why there's so much concern about non-retail cannabis license. According to the staff's report, there are 1,400 parcels eligible for cannabis licensing and they project that 40% of them will. This will change the nature of farming across the county. It is common for there to be pocket rural neighborhoods adjoining commercial ag with housing pressures being the way they are, is spreading. This is inevitable. But when you when you buy in a rural area, you sign a statement saying you understand that farming will occur with the potential noise, odor, and dust. When I signed that statement, my local farm was a flower field and cannabis wasn't legal. There was no thought that there would be 220,000 square feet of mechanized buildings with infrastructure needs of three big box stores like Costco running 24 seven, not to mention the frequent harvest recurring lots of personnel and large delivery trucks up and down our one lane road, a road that we neighbors maintain without county assistance. My area has had homes for over a hundred years and we have Existing cannabis greenhouses in the neighborhood cited so that they do not impact neighbors. We had a great relationship with the Heather Farm, but we really only know what cannabis license, what the cannabis license applicant intends from his preliminary application, which is scary. He indicates he's going to use the existing falling down greenhouses with no odor mitigation, eight foot fences with motion detection lighting, 40 large truck trips a week and more all within yards of many neighbors, a state park and, a, and an environmental reserve. And there's no means for us to provide input except if we have specific concerns about the actual construction permits as community input is not a part of the licensing process. As your neighbor, I'm asking you to consider how to better protect communities and the cannabis industry. It, it doesn't do any good to cite cannabis operations next door to a bunch of unhappy neighbors. And, you know, we've all stood up multiple times in front of the county. And this residential neighborhood surrounds the, the farm that is in question in our neighborhood. But I know that there are many other rural neighborhoods that will be horribly impacted if this passes. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. All right, that was Vicki. We will move on to the next member of the public who wishes to speak on this item. I'm seeing a hand raised by Paul Lego. Good morning, Paul. Will you please restate your name for the record? You have three minutes to speak. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, good morning. Great, good morning, uh, commissioners and, uh, and, and Mr. LaForte. Uh, my name is Paul Lego. And I live in La Selva Beach uh, near Manresa Uplands Campground. Uh, I just want to state for the record that I'm not opposed to cannabis or cannabis cultivation in appropriate locations, but I strongly believe that the setbacks that are being discussed today are too small and will allow cannabis cultivation to negatively impact families and children that are living on parcels adjacent to these potential grow sites. Um, I would specifically today like to question the recommendation from staff that these changes are exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. Uh, my understanding of CEQA is that the county has the responsibility to, pro to provide evidence to support its claim that these changes are exempt from CEQA. And I didn't see any evidence of that anywhere in this, uh, in the report. Um, on the contrary, I think that it's uh, common sense that if you reduce the setbacks from what was previously proposed, 
uh, you know, uh, particularly for these indoor nursery greenhouses, that your reduced setbacks are more likely to impact neighbors. In addition, and this is one of the subtleties here, we they've changed the way that setbacks are calculated. Um, at the beginning, when we were talking about all this, uh, uh, the setbacks were calculated lot line to structure. Uh, now the setbacks are being will are proposed to be calculated structure to structure, um, which, as you can imagine, in many cases will lower the distance from the grow operations to the impacted families. And you can imagine now 50 feet uh, from uh, you know from a nursery greenhouse, you know, to basically someone's bedroom window. Uh, I think that the environmental impacts, including odor, noise, traffic, light pollution, and more from cannabis cultivation are well documented. Uh, allowing these cultivation operations to be closer to residential housing can only make these impacts worse. I ask that you please take the time to research and document these impacts and analytically or scientifically determine what a safe setback is from families and children. I do not believe that you should approve a CEQA exemption today. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, that was Paul. Okay, it looks like we have a speaker by the name of Jean Marie. Um, good morning, will you please state your name for the record? You have three minutes. Yes, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. My name is Jean Marie Blackburn, and thank you for this opportunity to comment on agenda item number seven. And I, like many of my neighbors, want to point out the significant difference between the retail and non-retail cannabis ordinances. Both state that they have a similar purpose, which is to mitigate negative impacts, such as neighborhood disruptions. But when it comes to the setbacks, the two ordinances are very different. In the retail rules, a license is not to be issued within 300 feet of any family resident, urban or rural. For the proposed non-retail cannabis ordinance, the setbacks are 400 feet for outdoor and only 50 feet for the nursery operations. And as Paul mentioned, not only do the different set, setbacks, there are different setbacks, but they also have different ways of measuring. For retail, the measurement is to the property line whereas non-retail is to the actual inhabitable structure, making for short setbacks. So that is about 300 feet in a non-retail situation and 50 feet for a semi-truck trailer between a, a, a bedroom window and a grow house. I believe the setback should be based on proximity to the controlled substance. The Board of Supervisors were not in agreement when they addressed the non-retail cannabis ordinance in October 19th meeting, as indicated by their three to two vote. And to those attend attending the meeting, myself included, it seemed like it was just an ad hoc decision to return to the prior setbacks. The staff report did not indicate how this proposed option would address community concerns or provide for any input from the community. We are depending on you, the Board of Supervisors, to make reasonable decisions. And unfortunately, this proposal needs more substantiation and consideration to provide the supervisors with a complete package. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jean Marie. All right, I am seeing we have a hand raised by a gentleman by the name of Greg Fernandez. Good morning, Greg. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. And you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. Hi, my name is Greg Fernandez. I'm uh, uh, a cannabis uh, cultivator with a nursery license in uh, and processing and distribution in Santa Cruz up there on Hughes Road. We have been approved by the county to cultivate um, 
you know, roughly in 600,000 square feet to include nursery. And I just want to bring to your attention the difference of uh, cultivation and nursery. So dropping the nursery uh, set back to 50 feet makes all the sense in the world because there is no, no odor issues. There is no light issues. Uh, there's no noise uh, because the immature plants that start out as seeds or seedlings, clones and teens, they don't they don't begin to start emitting any odor until they're well into their um, cultivation uh, process. So, and nurseries are prevented from cultivating. They just sell immature plants. So um, I just wanted to make sure that you are aware of that because there's some uh, misrepresentations from the a couple of the speakers so far. And going, you know, a couple of this, the first two speakers for sure, they indicated they lived by this one problem uh, applicant who has to go through a, 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 a many more hoops to get licensed, by the way, they're on Crest Road or Crest Drive. I had an offer, I placed an offer to buy that property from the uh, Kitayama family. I know it very well. I've driven it at least 100 times, been on site. And we decided to, uh, against it because of the neighbors. It's a beautiful area. And I just, I, I knew that it would not fly with the neighbors. Now, if somebody came in with a nursery application, solely a nursery application, I, I, I would suggest that that would be okay because, there, again, there's no odor or light uh, pollution. Um, and let's see, something else was uh, uh, brought up. Oh, yeah, uh, the staff reports, something like uh, somebody said 40% of the 1,400 eligible uh, parcels. Goodness gracious. I've, I have driven uh, Santa Cruz County and called virtually every single possible um, uh, uh, licensable uh, property. And I'm telling you, there's no way in heck that we'll get to 40% saturation, not even close. And I've personally, again, driven every single property and, and attempted to contact uh, ownership. You might get 10% penetration. That's about it. Thank you, commissioners, for your time. Mr. Laforte, thank you. Um, and that's that. Have a great day. Thank you. All right, and I'm seeing that we also have a hand raised um, by Darren Story. Good morning, Darren. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Good morning, Jocelyn um, and commissioners. Thanks for taking my time. Um, I'm, I'm fine with the setbacks. Whatever is proposed, I feel like the state of the cannabis industry is really challenging right now. and economics is going to kind of settle this. There's a few good operators left in the county. We're already in parcels that most of us went through the full use permit when there still was 400 foot setbacks for CA parcel to um, grow site. So, you know, for those, for those of us that are established and struggling because we're arguing about, you, you know, one project like Greg just mentioned, um, at the, I believe it was a September meeting, Supervisor Koenig um, asked staff to come back with recommendations on how to stimulate existing operators and create a viable economic platform for the county, um, in particular to stabilize the tax revenue that's coming in because it looks like we're not going to have a whole lot of new licenses. And, you know, the, it's, it's important for the county to still have that, that stable revenue stream or at least give an opportunity for all of us to work together and create economic vitality for all our communities. And I would greatly appreciate if the commissioners would rekindle that request of staff today so that we can start talking about the future and how to work together and how to create, you know, businesses that everybody's proud of that don't infringe on other people's rights or, or, you know, perceivable enjoyment of their property. So uh, that's all my request, please. Let's um, try and find some solutions to move forward past the setback issues. Thanks a lot, Jocelyn. Have a great day. Thanks, Darren. All right. I see hand raised by Pat Malo. Good morning, Pat. Will you please restate your name for the record? Hi. <laughs> Hi, commissioners. Uh, this is Pat Malo. Um, I've been uh, born and raised in Santa Cruz County, 
Uh, I've spent probably close to a decade now working with the county, electeds, regulators, community members, neighborhood groups to try to come up with some sort of ordinance that would allow the existing industry of law-abiding medical uh, cannabis businesses who are obeying previous county ordinances into the new um, you know, statewide system that was rolled out in Prop 64 and before. Um, and ultimately, we've failed at that task. We had, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of groups, people interested in continuing to be legal uh, cannabis operators into the rec, adult use rec system from the med medical system. And now we're left with a handful of operators that really have you know, gone to hell and back um, in this process. And like other um, callers have said, or speakers have said, right now is the time where we should be focusing on making this process work. Um, I mean, we've had a C4 committee that I was a part of with many like of the stakeholders, community members, and uh, industry folks. And we really, you know, put something together that that we thought was a compromise. It bounced around in the county system. I know the Planning Commission has been a part of this process. It's been a long process, and um, we need to keep going forward in that and making it work. What we've seen throughout this has been uh, stumbling blocks of, you know, individual projects or individual gardens um, having conflicts with the neighbors and neighborhood groups, and neighborhood groups seeing no other option um, but to get involved in this like larger ordinance crafting process and to accomplish stopping one individual project, a couple of individual projects. Um, I think everyone who's been following this issue knows what neighborhood groups and what projects are the problem. And so really I'd like to, for us to come together as a community and solve those issues, but not get off track on the large thing that Santa Cruz County voted for to bring about legal legalized cannabis in this county, transition the old medical um, <clears throat> folks and people who have been participating and built this industry and provide tax revenue to go to things like the Thrive by Three program who we all came out and got behind. So I know that's a lot. Um, it's been a long process for all of us and uh, let's just keep moving forward. And um, thank you everyone on this call and everyone at this meeting. Thank you, Pat. All right, going back to the list of callers and hands raised, I see a hand raised by Tom Moran. Good morning, please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Uh, thank you, good morning. So my name is Tom Moran. I live off of Browns Valley Road in Coralitas. Um, again, thank you to everybody uh, for hearing our um, discussions this morning. Uh, others have already pointed out uh, clearly concerns which, you know, reference the um, current conflicts when you have uh, cannabis operations in residential areas. And I want to state, like everybody else, I have no objection to the cannabis industry. It's really just an issue of when the operations are intermingled in residential areas. Um, you know, in addition, I know there's a lot of discussion around Crest. There is also a large uh, cannabis operation on Browns Valley Road. Um, it is out of compliance uh, on screening and occasionally on odor control, uh, both of which I have addressed to the cannabis office, and uh, these have not been addressed. Um, as others have said, really one of the one of the concerns is the smell. Um, cannabis produces, and I, I looked this up, a volatile sulfur compounds, which is a similar chemistry to skunks, which, as you know, use this scent to drive off predators. So even though I live and I've lived in Coralitas for 10 years, and this is a, um, you know, a mixed agricultural residential area, given that cannabis wasn't legal, um, this is certainly not the kind of thing we would have anticipated even in an agricultural area. Um, therefore, what I ask of the, of the group is to please reconsider appropriate setbacks. Um, what that will do is mitigate the impact on residential, you know, people who have lived in these mixed residential areas and it would be, as others have said, uh, a good step so that we can all have a set of parameters we can work with going forward. And, you know, the industry can proceed and we can continue to, you know, value our, our quality of life uh, here in, in Santa Cruz County. 
So those are my comments. Thank you for your consideration and I appreciate having the opportunity. Thank you very much. All right, and I am seeing a hand raised by a gentleman just named Michael. So um, Michael, please state your full name for the record. You have three minutes. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Michael Bulch, and um, I live in the neighborhood that uh, has been referenced by other speakers where a large cannabis operation was um, proposed and has been sort of the, the um, genesis of the community act, um, activity around this issue. Um, I just want to comment on the, on the agenda item itself as written and, and how it was submitted to the commission. Um, you know, the, the, as mentioned by, by uh, Commissioner Freitas, the, the Board of Supervisors was very, actually very divided on this issue. And um, Supervisor Friend and Supervisor Caput both stood up and represented their constituencies in protection of these neighborhoods. So we appreciated that. So it was not a clear, clear item at all. And um, further, Supervisor Friend called out the cannabis office on, on their, their staff report in, and its appearance of, of uh, bias. And, you know, in reading the agenda item in there with regard to lack of odor control and just the assumption, and it truly is an assumption because it has neither been tested nor litigated in terms of an ex exemption from CEQA or the Coastal Commission, at full transparency, I've been a commissioner in another body in another county, and, and quite frankly, I would have been incensed to receive such a biased report from a, a county agency whose uh, charter is for regulation, not advocacy. And that's exactly how, how I read these reports coming from the cannabis office, because it disadvantages these, these families and these communities out here in favor of what is not a small industry. I, I've heard it referred to even in, in this um, uh, session today as nurseries and gardens um, had lacking in, in odor. Nothing could be further from the truth. All you need to do is look at the very first picture of, of Mr. Forti's presentation to see what sort of structure is being proposed or was being proposed as looming over the, the homes in, in this community. Fans in the background, lighting, and, and large structures within 50 feet, 50 feet of, of these homes. So I, I ask that the commissioners consider that. Um, I, I mean, some of you have pictures of family behind you in, in this session today, and, and these are the families that are out here now. So um, not only is this challenging for the cannabis industry, but it's challenging for us who live out here and are trying to live our lives in a peaceful and, and um, normal way. So I asked the commissioners to just um, uh, keep those setbacks out and solve the issue so this doesn't keep coming back. Protect our, our communities. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. All right, and it looks like we have a caller um, with us or it looks like maybe on the Teams app by the name of Lawrence. Um, Good morning, Lawrence. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Good morning. I'm Larry Azaro. I'm a native Santa Cruz and actually uh, ancestors were pioneers from the 1800s, early 1800s here. I have no interest in the argument about cannabis and who's growing it and all that crap. I was trying to follow the link going to the tiny homes meeting and I've been stuck here. Is there <laughs> it's the one that was scheduled. Um, so the tiny homes discussion is the next item on the agenda. So hold tight. Um, we'll call on you after that item uh, is presented and that it should be coming up shortly. Okay, thanks. You're Bye. welcome. <laughs> Bye. All right. Um, Okay, so I'll just go back to the public now. If you are a member of the public who would like to provide public comment on the this item that we're on right now, which is the cannabis um, ordinance amendments, um, please raise your hand. All right, I see a hand raised um, by Susan Williams. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. 
planning commissioners and staff, my name is Susan Williams, and I wanna thank you for this opportunity to address agenda item number seven. I'll focus my remarks on a point made in the staff report that cannabis is just like any other crop. If this were the case, there'd be little contention between cannabis operators and neighborhoods. When I think of farming in our area, what comes to mind are strawberry fields, artichokes, and apple orchards. The picture in my mind of what a cannabis operation looks like is very different. Cannabis is a highly regulated substance and has legal requirements that makes its operation and production very different from other types of crops and agriculture. While that's a good thing, protecting the crop and the community, it does not make it look like or feel like a typical neighborhood farm. It isn't just the regulated requirements that make this crop different. Cannabis requires very specific growing conditions to have high quality yields. Much of Santa Cruz County does not have the optimal climate for this crop due to our proximity to the coast and our humid climate. Because of this, this crop needs to be grown in a highly mechanized manner with round the clock lighting, noisy dehumidifiers and heaters to produce the desired quality and yields along our coastal zones. With this level of infrastructure, cannabis can be harvested multiple times a year, which means more large transportation trucks and traffic from personal vehicles than what most crops require. The amount of technical, mechanical, and delivery support to grow cannabis is truly different from what most of us think of commercial agriculture. Your responsibility as planning commissioners is to determine the land use compatibility and to ensure the fair treatment of existing neighborhoods as new types of industrial style farming are introduced into Santa Cruz County. Thank you for listening to me and I look forward to seeing your actions on this item. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Last call for public comments on this item, the cannabis ordinance amendments. Okay, I am not seeing any chair. I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Drake, and thank you to all members of the public who spoke on the matter. We really appreciate the input and the feedback. And at this time, we'll bring it back to the commission for further discussion and action. Um, would any commissioners like to speak? Commissioner Dan. Sure, thank you, Chair Gordon. Um, I will make a motion to um, approve the staff recommendation um, after I hear from other commissioners, but I just wanted to address a few things. Um, this has always been a balance. Um, this has been a long uh, iterative process. Um, this commission in 2018, I went through um, a very lengthy meeting where we um, adopted or recommended the ordinance that was eventually adopted to the Board of Supervisors. Um, I think we had uh, 18 separate motions um, that were recorded separately in order to achieve that. Um, Knowing this is an iterative process, I, I support the staff recommendation. Um, I do wanna make a couple comments based on what I heard from the public. And um, I'd like to start with just a basic um, uh, comment about how our democracy works. Um, a number of times it's been brought up that this was a three to two vote. And I just wanna point out that since the beginning of, um, I think uh, um, for a number of years, uh, we've had a split on the board and that's how democracy works. You don't need unanimity in our system. You need a majority. And so there has been a majority to move this forward. Um, our commission often um, is unanimous in our decisions, but that's not always the case at the board. Um, I also wanted to um, address some comments I heard about um, criticism about the staff report from Mr. Laporte. I also read that staff report and I just wanted to say that I thought it was extremely well-written and it was fact-based and it was neutral. And I feel that with this, this staff report as well, I believe they were referring to the staff report in October that went in front of the board, but I also wanted to um, 
to let Mr. Laporte know that um, I appreciated this staff report as well and felt that it was just very neutral and just very fact-based and I appreciate that. Um, and then as far as that press drive um, situation, and I believe most of the neighbors who spoke were neighbors of that neighborhood. My understanding is the cultivator who came to the board meeting in October indicated that he was not moving forward with that project. So, um, so I just wanted to point that out as well. Um, so I, I support what is in front of us. And um, like I said, I'm uh, prepared to make a motion when it's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. Um, any other commissioners? Chair Gordon? Yes, please, Commissioner Shepard. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Dan. I think it's a good staff report. I support its conclusion and would second the motion. Thank you so much. Commissioner Freitas? I think you're muted there. Yep. Thank you for reminding me. Um, I, I could not support a motion to approve this. Um, I think it is important that the public is aware that this recommendation came through on a three to two vote. Um, I think the residents who spoke today, and it was not just Crest Drive residents, there were other areas represented, uh, spoke very eloquently about their concerns. And I think what I heard them saying is they really want a community or input some other way of um, having some discussion about this. And I don't, I don't think that they feel they've been adequately heard. And I, I would like to make a motion that staff gather additional community input and that they examine other options that are possibilities for setbacks. And I would like to suggest that the temporary moratorium be extended I'm not sure that it needs to be extended for 10 months, such as in the previous um, recommendation. Um, and I, I also appreciated uh, a member of the public's comment that um, staff look into more incentives for existing or potential cannabis growers um, in this county. So I'd like to include that in my motion when I make it. And I'd like to listen to other commissioners now. Thank you, Commissioner Freitas. And uh, so to be clear, that wasn't a motion at this no, time. No, right. right. And Commissioner Lazenby, did you have any uh, comments to add? Yes, I do. I, um, I did live in commercial ag properties and the deed did say, you have to be, you, you're on notice that there will be unpleasant smells from animals and, um, it did not refer to large buildings or noise. So I think maybe these um, the members of the public might have been taken aback a little when the noise and the traffic came into play when it was not on their deed. I will have to agree with uh, Commissioner Schaefer Freitas that I think we are doing ourselves a disservice if we do not correct the impression or the optics that the public does not feel like we're representing them or protecting them. So I will vote with uh, Schaefer Freitas. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. I appreciate that. Um, that leaves me. So I, you know, I do see both sides of this. I you know, was not involved in the 2018 meetings that Commissioner Dan spoke of, but I can imagine how it's going. I guess I just want to be really clear on this item. Um, we've had, we've heard from a lot of members of the public that, you know, there's a broader challenge that they're seeing and, and feeling the impacts of, you know, not just the setbacks, but to be really clear, this item is only discussion around what the setback should be. Is that correct, Mr. Laporte? Yes. Thank you. Yes, this item is based on the board motion for just the setbacks in the commercial agricultural zone district only. And 
I just would also like to clarify that we this is aligning with other types of plants that can be grown within these areas. Is that correct? Uh, no, it, it's it's actually um, an expansion of setbacks required in the commercial agricultural zone district. So we have what's known as um, agricultural buffer setbacks mm -hmm. in um, for homes and uses that aren't ag adjacent to agricultural uses, which is a 200 foot setback from the property line of the ag zone parcel to the residence or the other use on the adjacent parcel. So the adjacent uses are supposed to be 200 feet away from the property line of the ag zone. So this is double that and could impinge uh, upon the usable land within the commercial agricultural zone district parcel by an additional 200 feet or um, potentially more than that if there's been a setback exception for the neighboring parcel. So, so that, that um, Chair Gordon, what I'm not understanding is this actually increases the minimum setback distance for outdoor cultivation uh, from 200 to 400 feet. So it's an increase which should satisfy some of the concerns of the neighbors. Uh, and it's more than other kinds of cultivation. What the other condition is to change the setback for nursery operations themselves from 50 to 100 feet. So that means I was thinking indoors particularly. Um, so we're, we are extending the protections for neighbors significantly um, with this, uh, with what is the staff is suggesting as a resolution. And that's what one of the reasons I am supporting it. And I think reducing the setback from the greenhouse doesn't make 50 feet, will help the industry and doesn't make a, doesn't really affect neighborhood concerns in the same way. So, uh, and I, and just, I think we all need to discuss this and see if we can find some common ground. If possible. Yeah, thank you. I, and I, that seems, I just want to clarify, we're going from 100 to 50, not 50 to 100, correct? So, so we're going from 100 feet to 400 feet for cultivation, outdoor cultivation operations. Oh, thank you. I, the, I got it wrong. The setback of 100 feet for indoor cultivation operations is not there's no proposed change for indoor cultivation operations the nursery setback is proposed to change from 50 or from 100 feet to 50 feet so it is a reduction um, but to provide some context on the nursery operations uh, nursery cannabis nursery operations do not include flowering plants um, so cannabis plants don't emit an odor uh, prior to flowering I think that is an, an important distinction to make for the public and for the commissioners to understand. These are uh, small seedlings and smaller unflowering plants, similar to any other commercial nursery operations. Um, and there is no odor associated with them. The security requirements would still be there. Um, but I think it's it's important to understand that there is a difference between a nursery in and a full cultivation operation. And it's a different license type. And it's restricted by the county and the state in different terms also. Thank you. And just to one last clarification, what is that distance for other types of nurseries? Is it 50 feet as well? Uh, no, so for other types of nurseries, there the only setback we have is the standard property line setback for development, which is 20 feet, but we're talking about the CA zone. So there is supposed to be an additional 200 foot buffer from the property line to an adjacent habitable use. So that would be an, essentially a 220 foot buffer um, is what's supposed to be there. Now those 200 foot agricultural buffers, um, people can be granted exceptions to them. Um, and they sign a similar waiver to any development where uh, adjacent to ag, there will be noise, smells, um, lights, all those things. Um, but I do think it's important for the commission to understand that uh, light pollution was a concern raised by numerous people uh, on 
at this uh, hearing and light pollution isn't allowed from cultivation operations, whether it be nursery or flowering, uh, we do have requirements included in our best management operations practices, which um, include the use of blackout curtains. So no light can escape a cultivation structure. So that, um, that part is addressed by our code and was um, considered by the county over the extensive time of developing these regulations through 2016 through 2000, uh, mid 18. So that part I, I do believe is important to understand. There is no light pollution from the cultivation operations. Can I ask one more clarification question? Of course. So let's go over this again because I think it's getting a little confusing, at least for me. So we are talking about a proposal that will change the outdoor cultivation activities from 100 to 400 square feet. And as, you explain, as you've explained that, that outdoor cultivation means growing plants through to the flowering stage, correct? That is correct. Okay, so we're increasing that setback. Yes. Then we are proposing to change the setback for nursery operations. We're going to reduce it. And that means where they're growing young plants. And I do remember that we added the provision to allow nursery operations when we amended the cannabis ordinance because the way we passed it in the first time didn't really provide what cannabis growers needed. They needed to be able to grow young plants. And since they didn't flower and produce smells and so on and so forth, that was an acceptable use. And now, of course, we provide for that. So we're just saying, you're saying, this is for young seedlings that are later transplanted. That's the other setback. I'm a yeah. little confused when you introduce the 200 foot setback. That's not a third setback. I am confused. I understand what's proposed. What does that have to do with the 200 setback, which is standard for all agricultural operations? Nothing. I was just trying to address uh, Chair Gordon's um, question in regards to what the setback would be for. Um, other types of nursery operations. And to simplify my answer, the setback would be 20 feet from the property line. Okay, so we are going, this proposal says that for cannabis, it shall be 50. 50 feet from an adjacent structure. So if there's a home on a property, it'd be 50 feet from that home on the property, but no development would be allowed within 20 feet of the property line at all. So it's the same, if not more. At least 20, but 50 feet from any structure. Yes. So considering those items that, you know, the agenda item today is setbacks. It's not whether a use is allowed in a certain place. It's not, you know, anything else about there, you know, if there's people that would like to comment on that from the public, there's other venues to do that. You can, you know, write to the board. You can do a lot of things. This item today, you know, it appears to me that we are increasing setbacks. We are meeting the needs of the community, and I would be happy to support it as is. Um, Chair? Yes, please. I'll make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. I'll second. We do have a motion and a second on the table to move the staff recommendation. Um, Ms. Drake, can we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Is there going to be any discussion before we? Do I apologize. That? Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I cannot vote uh, approval of this item. I think we've heard loud and clear this morning from community members. It's, there's even confusion among the board members trying to understand all this. And I, I heard voices saying today that they really want to be heard and that they'd like a little bit more time. They're well aware of the setbacks. They know about the 400, the increase to 400 feet. They understand that, but they still have some concerns and they feel that they have not been heard. So I, I cannot vote for this motion. Thank you, Commissioner Freitas. Would any other commissioners like to speak on the motion before we move to a vote? Well, I, I did hear some of the members of the public that said that the, uh, the measurement, whether it be a setback or an increase in a setback, that it was being calculated linearly from structure to structure. 
instead of from property line to habitable um, structure. Is, is there still confusion on that, Mr. Laforte? I don't believe there's any confusion on that. The way setbacks are measured for non-retail operations has not changed through the existence of the program. It has always been from the cultivation operation to um, neighboring structures. But the cultivation operation could be the property line. Am I correct? Or the last row of cultivation? Uh, it would have to be 20 feet from the property line. That is our development buffer for any use. Okay, thank you. Um, I did have one, I guess, additional question that I'm sure has been brought up, but it, it would help, you know, if there is still some confusion, this one might be one that could be asked by a member of the public is if there is a, uh, a nursery already you know, created, and then someone on a residential use would like to build a house or home closer, that would make that setback of the nursery need to be extended. What happens? I would ask um, Jocelyn to chime in, but I will do my best to answer. It is my understanding that if you would like to build within 200 feet of a property line um, adjacent to an agricultural uh, parcel, you have to obtain an agricultural buffer setback. Um, so agricultural in place to protect agricultural uses from competing non-agricultural uses. Um, this is documented in code in several places, and I will leave it at that for now. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think the clarity there that I was looking for, which I received, is that this is all documented and it the public does have a way to find out these questions. And maybe we can just really clearly state like who can they reach out to you if there are further questions or items of concern or or you know. Yes, and I've spoken to uh, members of the public those on this call uh, a, a few times prior to the previous board hearings. Okay, okay, thank you. That's my, all my questions and comments. And did any other commissioners wish to speak uh, before we vote? Okay, hearing none, let's please Ms. Drake do a roll call vote on the matter. All right. Commissioner Dan? Yes. You're, you're voting no on your motion? No, no, I was the motion, my motion was to approve the staff recommendation. I voted yes. Isn't that what we're having the roll call on? We're, we're having the roll call on Commissioner Dan, Commissioner Dan's motion to approve staff's recommendation. That clarifies. Does that make sense? Commissioner Shepard, does that, are you clear? Uh, no, Commissioner Dan, did you vote yes or no? I'm, I'm, I voted I'm, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Shepard? Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer Freitas? No. And Commissioner Lazenby? No. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Okay. The motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for that. Um, appreciate that. We'll close item seven at this time and move on to item number eight. Item eight is a study session to consider the updates to regulations concerning tiny homes on wheels. Um, this is gonna be a fun topic. I know we're all really excited to hear this one. Ms. Drake, do we have a Excuse staff me, report? Chair? Oh, please, yes. Is it, is it possible to just have a five minute 
break? Absolutely. Let's do that. Um, let's call a five minute break. It's 1040 now. Let's return at 1045. Actually, um, if, possible? If, if you don't mind, Chair Gordon, um, we are required to do a 10 minute break um, after three hours. So since we have so many speakers, it might make sense to just do 10 and then we're, we've got that done. That's perfect. Thank Sorry about you. That. I, no, appreciate that. Thank you. Sounds good. So 1041, 1051. Let's turn him back. All right. Thank you very much. All right. 751. Let's see if we've got all of our. Maybe we should do a quick roll call. Does that sound good? Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Sure. <laughs> So we're reconvening the Planning Commission meeting of uh, February 9th. We just took a 10 minute break. I'm going to take roll call, make sure we have everyone back with us today as far as the commissioners. Anyway, um, Commissioner Dan? Sure, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Shepard? Yes, I'm here. Commissioner Schaefer Freitas? Present. Uh, Commissioner Lazenby? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Here, thank you. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, then yes, let's um, uh, just to start over again here. We are moving on to item number eight, the study session to consider the updates to regulations concerning tiny homes on wheels. And Ms. Drake, I believe we have Daisy here and a staff report. That is correct. Daisy, did you have a PowerPoint? Um, yes, I have a PowerPoint. Okay, good morning. I'm I am getting a little bit of feedback on yours as well, a little bit of a buzz on your let's see how that goes with your microphone. We had that same issue with Sam. Um Alice, will you please load the PowerPoint presentation for this item? Thank you. And then um Daisy, as you move through, just say next slide and, and Alice will advance your PowerPoint. Let me see how your audio sounds. Okay, it sounds like it still has a bit of a buzz to it. It does. I don't know if you have, um, Sam had the issue and then he switched over to his um, headset and it worked out much better, but you have a headset on, so I'm not sure what the I, issue might be. I do. Um, do you have another one maybe handy? Um, I don't have another headset, <laughs> uh, just the one. Um, hmm. I could disconnect my headset and just uh, try to use, oh, hold on, I'm trying another one. I thought that might be a good idea. Thank you. Okay, is that better? It is better. Yes, thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, much better. Thank you. Good morning. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, good morning. Sorry about that. Not sure what the problem was there. Um, great. So thank you so much, uh, Chair Gordon and Commissioners. Uh, the purpose of today's study session is to provide information to you about options for regulations for tiny homes that are currently being considered, and then receive direction as to how staff should move forward uh, with an ordinance. Um, your commission first considered regulations for tiny homes at a study session on March 24th, 2021. And at that time, staff was proposing to develop tiny homes regulations concurrently with the updates to regulations for accessory dwelling units per direction from the Board of Supervisors. Um, however, since there are unique issues to consider regarding tiny homes um, at that March 24th study session, your commission gave staff direction to separate these two policy projects and conduct additional research and public outreach for tiny homes. Uh, so then in December of 2021, uh, we restarted work on this project and we conducted three community meetings with over 150 attendees. In addition to oral comments received at these meetings, we've also obtained feedback from over 50 written public comments and over 350 online survey responses. 
Additionally, we received feedback from the Housing Advisory Commission in January, and we've also reviewed tiny home ordinances uh, prepared for seven other California jurisdictions and coordinated with staff from some of those jurisdictions. And a summary of this research and input is provided as uh, exhibits attached to your staff report. Next slide, please. Okay, so before we get into the details of the regulations that we're considering, it's important to review what we mean when we say tiny homes. So tiny homes are small independent housing units, generally less than 400 square feet. In the industry, the term tiny home can mean either a small house on a foundation or a house on wheels that can be towed to different locations. Um, currently, the Santa Cruz County Code already allows tiny homes on foundations as permanent housing as small as 150 square feet, um, either as primary homes or as ADUs, uh, subject to relevant zoning code and residential building code standards. Tiny homes on foundations that are 400 square feet or less may also apply special standards in Appendix Q of the Residential Building Code, which has allowances for ceiling height, lofts, ladders and stairs, and egress windows. In comparison to tiny homes on foundations, Tiny homes on wheels are treated as recreational vehicles in Santa Cruz County, and the county code does not uh, currently allow permanent habitation of recreational vehicles, except in certain designated RV and travel trailer parks. The current code does allow RVs to be used as temporary housing during construction of a home on a foundation. Um, and then note that the building code does not automatically apply to tiny homes on wheels um, since they are considered vehicles. Um, so since tiny homes on foundations are already allowed uh, here in Santa Cruz County, the proposed regulations that staff is looking at focus on tiny homes on wheels specifically. Um, although staff does propose to structure the regulations to define both tiny homes on foundations and tiny homes on wheels in order to clarify what regulations are associated with, with each of these housing types. Um, a key question to ask here is why are we considering allowing tiny homes on wheels as permanent dwellings at this time? In other words, what is the purpose of developing these regulations? Um, Santa Cruz County is experiencing a housing crisis and tiny homes on wheels represent one uh, uh, afford a more affordable housing option that has been gaining popularity in, re in recent years. Um, tiny homes on wheels tend to be attractive and affordable to buyers because they are compact, prefabricated but customizable, cost less and take less time to construct compared to homes on foundations, um, can be owned separately from the land where they're parked and can be moved. Um, and then a related question, a question to consider is whether standard RVs and travel trailers should then be considered as types of tiny homes on wheels. Uh, most jurisdictions uh, with tiny home ordinances have not opted to include RVs and travel trailers in their tiny home regulations and have narrowly defined tiny homes on wheels as using residential building materials and resembling residential buildings rather than vehicles. Um, that said, the difference um, between tiny homes on wheels and RVs and park trailers is generally aesthetic um, and the county could potentially incorporate RVs and park trailers into our tiny home ordinance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so at the community meetings, as well as in written comments and in our online survey, we've seen overwhelming support from the public for development of regulations for tiny homes on wheels. Um, here you can see the results of the online survey. Over 80% of survey respondents are very interested in these regulations. So that indicates to staff that um, the county should move forward with developing regulations. Um, overall, a few key themes and concerns have emerged from the public. Those interested in developing tiny homes are mostly drawn to this housing option uh, because it uh, is a lot more affordable and faster um, than development of a home on a foundation, especially given the current housing crisis and supply chain issues. Um, tiny homes on wheels are especially interesting to CZU fire survivors as an efficient way to rebuild housing units on their properties. Um, either as an interim option before a home on a foundation is developed later, or as an alternative to a home on a foundation, in which case the tiny home could potentially be towed off-site uh, in the event of another emergency. 
there is concern that tiny home regulations for Santa Cruz County may not be developed in time for CZU survivors to make use of this option. Um, so there is some sense of urgency coming from the public for that reason. We've also heard that applicants would like to be allowed as much design flexibility as possible, but there's also some concern about mitigation of potential neighborhood impacts, such as parking. Um, and then in rural areas, a repeat topic of conversation and concern has been septic constraints, and more specifically the cost of septic systems, alternatives to septic systems, potential impacts of septic system requirements um, on development feasibility of tiny homes on wheels. Next slide. So then in terms of regulation options for tiny homes on wheels, there are many policy questions to consider. So first and foremost is geographic location. Most jurisdictions who have that have tiny home ordinances have tended to limit tiny homes on wheels to single family zone districts. And some jurisdictions have also limited location based on environmental risk factors, such as fire danger and sensitive habitat areas. Um, our survey results indicate that about three quarters of respondents would like tiny homes to be allowed on any parcel or on any parcel that allows residential land use. Other respondents have felt that tiny homes on wheels should be limited to certain types of parcels, such as existing mobile home parks, large rural parcels, urban parcels that are closer to services, um, and CZU burn area parcels. Um, there was also some survey response and community discussion about allowing tiny homes on wheels on certain rural parcels that are currently considered unbuildable for standard foundation homes. Um, there's also discussion about allowing tiny homes on wheels outside of residential districts, for instance, on church properties. Um, staff is recommending that the Santa Cruz County ordinance would allow tiny homes on wheels anywhere that residential land use is allowed, subject to discretionary use approvals in any zone district where use approvals are usually required for homes on foundations. Um, also, the ordinance um, should continue to allow tiny homes on wheels wherever RVs are allowed. Next slide, please. Um, and then in terms of configuration and number of tiny homes on wheels on a parcel, there are several options that the county could potentially allow. Staff recommends that tiny homes on wheels be allowed to substitute for one or more of the allowed dwellings on any given parcel. We heard support for the, uh, from the community for this idea. Um, staff also heard community support for larger tiny home villages, as well as additional accessory structures on wheels. Um, but staff does not recommend pursuing those ideas at this time, um, since added density um, would require additional analysis and possibly general plan amendments and environmental review. Um, to give the commission an understanding of what staff is proposing, here's an example um, of a single family parcel. On the top right of the slide, we can see what is currently allowed um, on this example parcel, one single family home, one ADU and one junior ADU, all on foundations. The four site plans on the bottom of the slide would all be allowed with staff recommendation. So the first site plan shows a tiny home on wheels being used as an ADU. The second site plan shows a tiny home on wheels being used as the primary home, and there's also an ADU on a foundation located on the parcel. The third plan shows a tiny home on wheels in addition to a primary dwelling and an ADU on foundations. And then the fourth plan indicates three tiny homes on wheels. Um, based on staff's review of ordinances um, that have been created for other jurisdictions, the first site plan configuration option shown here is by far the most common where a tiny home can be substituted for an ADU. However, some jurisdictions have also allowed these other configurations as well. Next slide. Um, and then there are a variety of options for development standards for tiny homes. Overall, uh, survey respondents have been in favor of having special standards for tiny homes on wheels that are different from development standards for ADUs or other buildings on foundations. Um, in particular, since tiny homes on wheels are movable, it may be appropriate to have more relaxed development standards applied to tiny homes on wheels in comparison to buildings on foundations. Um, however, it may also be appropriate to apply existing development standards in the county code to tiny homes on wheels in order to promote neighborhood cohesiveness and avoid confusion related to having yet another set of standards in our code. 
Um, so staff uh, has reviewed all of all of these options and recommends that setbacks for area ratio, lot coverage, and parking uh, should be the same as that uh, that we require for accessory dwelling units. Um, this is how most other jurisdictions um, have applied development standards for tiny homes on wheels. Um, however, staff does recommend um, certain special standards to apply to tiny homes on wheels, and that would include unit size and height, which are constrained by DMV requirements, um, as well as placement of tiny homes on wheels in driveways um, if other development standards are met. So the advantage of locating a tiny home on wheels in an existing driveway is that the property owner may not need to build a new parking pad for the tiny home and also may avoid disturbing a new area of a site to accommodate the tiny home. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Ellis. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then in terms of design, um, as I mentioned earlier, tiny homes on wheels are generally built to resemble homes rather than vehicles. And jurisdictions that allow tiny homes on wheels as permanent housing um, have tended to include design requirements in their ordinances that set tiny homes apart from other movable homes, such as RVs and travel trailers. Um, and then with design requirements, it is important to keep in mind that most tiny homes on wheels are going to be prefabricated. And while there are a range of architectural styles that can be achieved, the overall shape of the homes is somewhat boxy in order to meet DMV height and width requirements for towing. Um, so as a result of that, um, other jurisdictions have not really made any overall architectural style requirements, but have instead taken the approach of prescriptive requirements, such as, for instance, minimum roof pitch, a menu of allowed siding materials, building grade windows and doors, skirting around wheels, and integrated mechanical equipment. Um, at our community meetings, members of the public have generally been supportive of these types of design standards, especially in denser urban neighborhoods as long as they are not difficult for a standard tiny home prefab manufacturer to achieve. Um, some feedback has been received that perhaps the ordinance should not include design requirements at all um, and should consider including um, RVs or travel trailers um, to qualify as tiny homes on wheels. Um, so staff recommends that tiny homes on wheels should be required to incorporate residential building materials, uh, should, in should incorporate mechanical equipment within the structure, and should be located um, on a parking pad that meets structural specifications that staff can develop uh, in cooperation with the county building official. Staff does not recommend that tiny home design be required to meet the menu of ADU objective design criteria that were uh, recently approved by the board for inclusion in the county's ADU regulations uh, because most of those standards are related to the ADU aesthetically matching the primary dwelling and that is less important for a tiny home on wheels since it can be moved off site. Next slide, please. Um, and then two other uh, issues that will be critical to consider for tiny homes on wheels are utility requirements and ownership and occupancy. Um, so in terms of utilities, most, jurisdic most jurisdictions require connection to a sewer or septic system, a water system, and the electric grid, but some do allow off-grid systems if there are backup systems available. Um, there's a lot of discussion on this topic at the community meetings and environmental health uh, department staff were able to clarify that for off-grid wastewater systems, rural properties must, by, by law, by state law, are required to have enough septic system capacity to support dwellings, uh, including tiny homes on wheels. Um, environmental staff further clarified that property owners with uh, backup septic in place are able to use composting toilets and there's no associated uh, permit requirement for composting toilets. Um, staff recommends that the county um, allow tiny homes on wheels to have off-grid electric water and wastewater um, if the backup systems exist. So for off-grid electric, that would mean that um, uh, the tiny home on wheels would need to have a renewable energy system capable of supplying 100% of the electricity needs and would need to have the ability to connect to the grid. Um, Off-grid water and wastewater tiny homes on wheels within the urban services line would need the ability to connect to the water and sewer systems. 
Um, and then off-grid water and wastewater tiny, home on, tiny homes on wheels outside the urban services line would need um, backup water and septic systems with capacity to serve the tiny home on wheels per state law. Um, and then in terms One of- One quick question about what you just said. Yes. What is a backup system? A backup system means that there, so it means like that- for, Specifically for the water and septic. Yeah, so, so in the rural area, a uh, backup wastewater system would mean that the property has a septic system with the capacity to serve the tiny home on wheels. And the water? That there is a water system with the capacity on site or I, I don't know, there's some areas of the rural the rural um, county that have like community water systems. So either an on-site water system or community water system with capacity to serve the tiny home on wheels. But I mean, are you saying they would need to develop a well serve water? I mean, in the valley, to get a connection is complicated and expensive, but it's the only way you can build anything. So what would this mean for a tiny home user? Yeah, so my understanding is that the state law requires that for uh, water and wastewater that there be um, a system in place to serve the tiny home on wheels um, uh, uh, on grid um, and, and that if there is that system available, then tiny homes on wheels can use the option of, of being off grid. Um, and yeah. that's sort of where the state law lies today. I, I understand that clearly about electricity. I'm still not, have you looked, maybe it just needs look further looking at. In the Valley, there's a couple of water systems. There's some community ones, and then there's the San Lorenzo Valley. To build anything now, you have to get a, you have to get a well served letter or you have to develop a well, which involves permits and inspections. Mm -hmm. So well, how would we handle tiny home service for water? Right, yeah. Right. If, we, if we don't know now, that's an area that I think we'll need to explore, obviously. Yeah, I think that could be, it could be explored further and more detail could be provided. Um, it, it could be that a will serve letter would be required. It could be that actual construction of a well would be required um, depending on the available, um, the water systems that are available to the property in question. Um, okay. And, and uh, it's, this is an area where staff could, could um, invite, for instance, environmental health staff to join, join us at, the next public hearing on this topic to provide more detail um, to the commission, if if that would be useful. Well, I, I mean, I think that's going to be a somewhat thorny issue. That's all. Um, uh, but I, but I'm interested to see what we could work out. Also, on the mobility of tiny homes, the I had a question about would we require that a calling vehicle, especially in the very fire sensitive areas, the idea was that. One of the advantages is you could move your you can move your tiny home, but would you do other jurisdictions require that there be a hauling vehicle and during fire danger times so they can get out? Uh, no, not not that I'm aware of. Okay, I'm sure other people have plenty of questions, so I'll stop mine there. Okay. Um, all right, so I will finish up my presentation here. Um, so, oh, regarding um, ownership. Uh, because tiny homes can be moved off-site, tiny homes on wheels are considered to be uh, personal property as opposed to land and buildings on foundations, which are considered real property. So for that reason, ownership of tiny homes is separate from ownership of land and other real property. Um, so staff recommends um, allowing tiny homes on wheels to locate on land owned by others in order to keep tiny homes affordable. This aligns with feedback we've received from the public. Um, staff also recommends that the county ordinance would should not include short term or not allow short term rentals, meaning rentals for less than 30 days in tiny homes on wheels. Um, since uh, these homes are being considered as an affordable housing option, um, this aligns with what other jurisdictions have done and also aligns with feedback from the community. Although staff has received some feedback that short term rentals should be allowed in order to keep more flexibility in our tiny homes regulations. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then in terms of what approvals to require for tiny homes on wheels 
Uh, most jurisdictions require that they be built to either the American National Standards Institute uh, 119.5 Park Model Recreational Vehicle Standards or the National Fire Protection Association 1192 Standard on Recreational Vehicles and that they must be certified with the DMV. Uh, beyond those requirements, some jurisdictions have added additional construction requirements. Some other jurisdictions have added more flexibility um, in terms of construction requirements. For instance, uh, in Humboldt County, in the event that a tiny home on wheels owner wants to modify their ANSI or NIFBA unit or build their own tiny homes on tiny home on wheels, um, that jurisdiction allows compliance with the residential building code um, with approval of the chief building inspector. Um, when we asked about permit requirements for tiny homes on wheels in our survey, um, respondents tended to prefer that tiny homes be permitted similarly to RVs or in some combination of RV permits and building permits. Um, staff recommends that we follow the lead of other jurisdictions and allow compliance with ANSI or NIFBA and also offer the alternative of compliance with the building code. Um, staff also recommends that tiny homes on wheels uh, proposed to, the, uh, to be parked in areas with high or very high fire danger should be subject to fire safe standards, um, similar to those required for buildings on foundations. Um, and then staff recommends that the county's ordinance should lay out a simple ministerial approval process for tiny homes on wheels. So applicants would submit um, information about the tiny home itself, um, along with a site plan showing where the tiny home would be parked. Um, and staff would verify compliance with development and design standards, construction requirements, and registration for travel on roadways. And then in some cases, discretionary permits, such as coastal development permits may be required. Um, and staff does recommend that the ordinance should require discretionary permits in cases where discretionary permits would be required for ADUs. Um, and then one, one additional issue that was raised by uh, members of the public was some concern about maintenance of tiny homes on wheels over time. And it was suggested that tiny homes on wheels permits or approvals could perhaps include a required permit renewal every certain number of years um, to avoid public nuisance or code enforcement um, situations that can be challenging to resolve. Um, of course, any requirement for a permit renewal process necessitates additional planning department staff time and resources that may not be available. Um, so that's the trade-off there. Um, staff does recommend that the commission consider requiring a permit renewal every five years. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then with that, um, staff recommends that your commission conduct a study session to discuss the proposed amendments to the county code regarding tiny homes, and then direct staff to prepare an ordinance with these amendments, along with a CEQA notice of exemption for consideration by your commission at a noticed public hearing on a date uncertain. And staff does recommend that the ordinance uh, be bifurcated in order to allow for approval outside the coastal zone upon board of supervisors approval. So that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Daisy. Great presentation and really great work on this. I know this is a lot to get through uh, and when we're creating a new code. If anything is challenging, especially a new building type that hasn't been done. I just wanna make a few quick comments. Um, you know, last time we did a study session on the ADUs that you led, that was really, it was went really well, I thought, and you were able to capture kind of all of our random ideas and put them into a thought out plan. So really great work on that. And I, uh, glad you're, you know, on this one and able to help us out with that. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a lot of back and forth. So, um, and then I wanted to take a quick pause and just understand a little process. I have a process question here for the commissioners. Um, I assume we have a lot of public comment. So would it be appropriate to maybe have a, a few smaller questions now and allow the public comment to, to happen before we really dive in? Well, I was thinking maybe we could have some comments now because some of our questions may be ones the public wants answered anyway. Yeah, and then after public comment, you know, with something complicated like this, it might be helpful to just kind of go like issue by issue. Um, but we can get to that after public comment. I agree with that approach. Okay, that, that sounds good. A few questions, high level stuff, and then maybe step by step after public comment. That sounds great. And then who would like to start? Well, um, I'll start. Please. Um, I had a couple questions for Daisy. Um, there, 
I think the report is thorough, but it leaves some areas that are just leave me still scratching my head. And we, they're mostly about uh, water and sewer and environmental concerns. For, let me give a very focused question. For example, we have a tiny home in our neighborhood that's parked, not connected to anything. I think they're just storing it there. But right now, there's no setback from the creek. It's three feet from Sandy Creek. In your estimation, Daisy, I didn't see much about tiny homes conforming to those kinds of requirements, like setbacks from uh, riparian areas or something. Would they still, in what you're proposing, would they still be subject to those kind of setbacks? Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, so what staff is proposing is that tiny homes on wheels would be subject to the same requirements, the same setback requirements that we require for accessory dwelling units. Um, and those setbacks are standard setbacks of four feet, uh, four feet on the side, four feet on the rear, and then uh, whatever front yard setback is required in the zone district. But in addition to those setbacks, ADUs are also subject to environmental buffers in Title 16 of our code, um, just like all buildings on foundations. Um, so we are proposing that tiny homes on wheels would be subject to those same environmental buffers, and that would include uh, buffers from riparian areas. Okay, and then I see in what you're proposing, we you would allow ADUs in driveways, except when they inhibit people's access to their garage. So that is kind of gray. So let's say you have a pad in front of your garage and your garage is full of stuff and you allow an ADU, are you saying, I'm sorry, a tiny home? Yeah, that's a little unclear. And then it brings the same question to me as if you parked a tiny home on a garage, once again, would they just run a hose to the, to the, um, to the primary residence's water and septic or in, in which case they're more like an RV. I'm, I'm a little confused how that works. And from what I've heard, um, um, tiny homes on driveways are gonna be a relatively controversial topic because there's an awful lot of cul-de-sacs and potentially having a tiny home and there, uh, many of the driveways is a serious, you know, it would impede traffic, fire safety, you know, all, just crowdedness. I, I'm unconvinced that's such a great idea, but what did you mean in what you talked about, about allowing tiny homes and parking and on driveways? Sure, yeah, thank you. So. Um... What staff would be proposing there is that tiny homes could be parked in a driveway as long as they're meeting uh, the development standards, uh, the other development standards in the code. So that would include the setbacks that I just mentioned, um, uh, as well as the parking requirements um, for the tiny home and for the main dwelling or ADU or any other you know, buildings on foundations that are located on the property. Well, um, that's that's what I'm. I guess what I'm asking. Let's say you have a single-family home, which may or may not have an ADU, and they have a standard two-car drive, and they have a two-car driveway. So, if we end up requiring a parking space for a tiny home, because we might want to have a hauling truck available, and then the homeowner has their two cars, then we're just increasing off-street parking immediately. I I don't see how what you mean quite. Sure, yeah, so to use that example, so let's say that you have a standard kind of single family home, it's got a two car garage, and then in front of that there's, you know, a parking, you know, a driveway that can fit two more cars. We, under this proposal, we wouldn't allow a tiny home on wheels to be parked in that driveway because it would block required parking for the primary dwelling. So, okay, that's much more clear, thank you. When would you allow then a tiny home in front on a standard driveway in a single family home, or did you have some other concept of what you meant by a driveway? Sure, so so let's say you have like say a larger rural parcel that has a, a longer driveway um, with a big parking pad and turnaround area, and there's extra space already on that driveway where you could accommodate a tiny home on wheels without blocking any of the required parking or, or garage access for the primary dwelling, 
um, then in that case, um, staff is proposing that you would allow the tiny home on wheels to be parked there, as long as you're meeting other requirements as well, such as the, the setback requirements. You know, a lot of driveways are just along the side of properties. Um, and so, you know, we, we would still require a, a side yard setback for the tiny home on wheels. So it wouldn't be able to be accommodated in all of those types of driveway okay. situations. That, that makes more sense to me. But what about if you had such a place, and there are many, um, would the tiny home then just to deal with septic and the water backups, would the primary residence septic system in the valley, they're all septic systems and water hookup have to, would they have to demonstrate that they have the excess capacity and would they just hook up by a hose? Yeah, they would need to demonstrate that they have the capacity um, in their existing systems on site or or upgrade their systems. Um, and the staff recommendation has not gotten into the details of exactly let's say how a connection would be required and what that would look like, but the commission could certainly give staff direction on limitations or guidance that we might want to provide in the code about, about that. Yeah, I just think there needs to be a lot of development about how we can, the utility connections, the water, the septic, et cetera, how it's all going to work so we don't raise false expectations on either side. I mean, it sounds good, but we need to deal with fire hazard zones, you know, water systems and septic systems, even because of the state requirement that they're back up. So that's more complicated. And I don't feel that the staff report has really investigated that uh, very well. And I think to be responsible about this, we're going to have to look into it very carefully. And the other question I personally had is, um, I noticed in your staff report, one of the reasons for tiny homes is if there were fire danger that they could be pulled out. And that was my question. Um, in that case, how do we know they have a tow vehicle uh, available? Because you could just park one and drive away and then it's a sitting duck in a fire situation. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that there's a way to get them out of there? That was one of the advantages of having them. Uh, I'm not saying that it can't be done, but I think it needs to be explored that if we are going to allow them because they're so mobile, then we got to make sure they're really mobile in an emergency because, you know, during the fire, you had to get out of there in three hours or two or suddenly or immediately. So I just want to make sure that we are thinking about fire issues throughout development of this ordinance. I'm not saying that's a bad idea. I think that's just responsible, that's all. Um, yeah, I think I could respond to that just briefly, sure. which is to say that, um, you know, I think staff was recognizing the movability of tiny homes on wheels as a potential advantage to owners of tiny homes on wheels. Um, so if there were an emergency in the future, those, those owners could, plan ahead of time to have a haul vehicle in place. Um, it could be overstepping uh, in terms of a zoning ordinance to require a, a haul vehicle on a property that has a tiny home on wheels, but um, I haven't seen that in other ordinances. I guess I'll just put I, it that I, way. I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting that requirement. I just want to make sure that when we think of them as movable, what, what does that really mean in a rural area? Got it. So I won't take up any more time because I'm sure the other commissioners have questions as well. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Great questions. Did anyone else want to um, ask a few things quickly? Commissioner Lazenby? I do have one question and that is regarding plan development, such as age, age restricted single family home communities, that where the plan development documents, the underlying mandates, require that there be only one habitable structure on the property. 
and most properties are postage size anyway, but there are a couple that are because of the perimeter and the configuration, they do have larger backyards. Would there be tiny homes on wheels allowed there? Can you overstep an ordinance from the municipality or the um, whichever uh, agency created that plan development? Um, you know, I think that would be a question that staff would need to look into a little bit more. Uh, what I would say is regarding like accessory dwelling units on foundations, um, the cat, their state law explicitly um, requires local jurisdictions to allow ADUs regardless of any um, uh, local ordinances or or CCNRs associated with homeowners associations. Um, there isn't a similar you know state mandate regarding tiny homes on wheels. Um, uh, so my understanding then is that uh, our ordinance on tiny homes on wheels would not, you know, supersede uh, a local HOA requirement um, or, but then in terms of, uh, you know, another ordinance that exists and how that those ordinances are put together for specific planned unit developments, staff would need to look into that a little bit more to, to understand the interaction there. Thank you. And I appreciate your presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Commissioner Dan, I think you were up next. Um, I did actually think Commissioner Schaefer Great has had her hand up long oh, ago. <laughs> if you'd like to go, I Melanie. So I oh, you know, I really, um, at this point, I'd like to hear from the public. I, I feel bad that they waited so long for this item. So I, I will hold my questions till after public comment. Uh, okay, I'll ask some questions now then. Um, I want to thank Daisy for the staff presentation. It was really um, excellent. Um, I had just some general like broad questions that I thought maybe I could ask now and then if there's not really an answer. Maybe we can think about it during the uh, public comment. And, and that is, um, you know, first I just want to say like when this came to me, I wasn't sure how I could ever see this I what didn't wasn't even clear on the distinction between an RV and a tiny home, and I think I, that's what I said a year ago when we brought this up. And but now I do, and I so I credit you for that, and um, so I really want to thank you for that. Um, so, so the one of the questions I had was kind of a, I guess this would fall into like a health and safety building code kind of um, like bucket, and that is, um, you know, since in the past we've kind of um, distinguish between uh, a legal dwelling, which we're considering making tiny homes now, um, and and, um, and like an RV, which is personal property that you drive around and visit places and whatever. Um, and the state code is always um, said, like, if you have a mobile home, it has to be on the foundation. And, um, and I believe that's probably for some safety reasons. So I guess the question is kind of, um, so, what what are we going to do to kind of satisfy that kind of safety issue? And I know we don't have tornadoes here, or, um, things like that. But I imagine, you know, and I, and I saw there was a reference like, oh, we're going to have to work that out with the building code. But I guess so. What is it now that's happening that we're considering kind of throwing that out and then saying no, this is important enough. You know, we're in a housing crisis, whatever. Um, that we're going to do this, but then also, what are we going to do to make sure, like at a high wind event, you know, this doesn't blow over, or in an earthquake, or can are these safe in an earthquake? I guess so. I, so that might be for later, or the next time this comes forward. Um, so that was one kind of overarching question, and then the other one, which was referenced in the staff report, was how we deal with this from the assessor's point of view. And I, you know, I'm still not quite clear on, on that distinction. You know, if they're going to be primary dwellings, <laughs> we're kind of at odds with <laughs> how they're defined in state code. And I know you're saying, like, we're going to look into that. So I guess I'm just kind of doubling down on that's something that we need to figure out. And, um, you know, so if you're a homeowner and you build a parking pad, and I guess the process would be you would rent your space for the tiny home, um, you know, what does that do? What's the, is there a, what do we do with that? Like, you know, cause we're, it's a dwelling unit, but yeah. Um, 
And so I think I'll leave it there. Um, I had questions about utilities that you answered. So um, that was great. Oh, my other one was about height. Um, I didn't, I, I think I saw a reference to height, but I also was wondering how that's measured. Is it measured from the, the, where the wheels touch the parking pad or is it measured from where that dwelling actually starts? And then the second question is, um, I wasn't clear on, on what the proposed max height would be and whether or not there might be different max heights depending on where the tiny home might be located. So I'll okay. stop there <laughs> and um, let others speak. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so I can briefly address these questions. In terms of the you know safety question, um, you know, I, I would say the main reason that, you know, staff is considering tiny homes on wheels um, as permanent dwellings at this time is from direction from the Board of Supervisors. Um, and that's coming from the community, ultimately, and in reaction to the housing crisis and this being another, you know, option uh, for housing. Um, interestingly, I haven't seen in a really most other zoning ordinances, requirements for things such as tie downs, um, but that's certainly something we could look into um, and research more and talk more with staff from other jurisdictions that have had um, ordinances in place for a couple of years um, to see whether that's um, something that makes sense to include um, for safety reasons. Um, and then in terms of the assessor's office, yeah, so so my understanding in terms of property value, you know, associated with a, prop, a property that has a tiny home on wheels, you know, your property value comes from your buildings on foundations and then any, you know, site improvements that you have. So tiny homes on wheels don't necessarily increase property value. Um, in California, there aren't many jurisdictions that are allowing tiny homes on wheels as primary dwellings. Um, they're mostly allowing tiny homes on wheels just as ADUs so far. Um, so there aren't uh, there aren't many places to look to for examples, but there are jurisdictions outside California that staff can look at for examples. And then we can also um, coordinate with our assessor's office here to better understand um, what the impact might be. Um, and so you're, you get reassessed though if you build an ADU and your property yes. taxes go up. Yes. So I wonder if the assessor is going to look at if you build a parking pad and you rent to an ADU, whether that increases your, because I mean, you do like, I guess the whole point of property taxes is like to help pay for services and roads and all that stuff. So I guess that would be occurring if you mm -hmm. add a tiny home on your property. So it seems, yeah. I, it's a fascinating and interesting policy question. <laughs> yes, it is. And that's definitely uh, on on our list uh, from a staff perspective to coordinate with the assessor's office. It's one of our next steps. Um, and then in terms of height, my understanding in California is that the height limit is 13 feet, six inches um, uh, for a tiny home to, or for, you know, a, uh, for towing. Um, and I, I actually don't know if that's measured, how, where that's measured from exactly. And staff can research that and make sure we include that in the ordinance. Um, but our <laughs> our idea was to require just the height that's, you know, for the max, the, okay. yeah, the height that's set by the DMV because that's ultimately it's going to be lower than anything else okay. that we that have in our, in our code. So the photos that you showed us in your presentation, those were all the height of around 13 feet? That's yeah. what generated the question was, I mean, I loved the photos. They look, they're adorable units. Um, some of them looked, they looked pretty tall, like comfortable, but you know, they looked above. Yeah, most of these units have lofts in them, um, small lofts, but they have lofts in them. Um, I, I would just say, you know, not all of those photos are from California. So there are some, so the height is set by the state DMV and it's, it differs um, across states, um, but only by a, a few feet. Okay. Um, yeah. And then I guess I just, I forgot to say this. I am just to let the commissioners know, I am interested in streamlining a process for CZU, the CZU burn scar. So we could all just kind of think about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, thank you, Daisy. 
appreciate the interest. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. Uh, all great questions. Good start. I have a probably way too many, so I'm going to probably hold off for now too. And then um, if, if ever, the other commissioners are ready, let's move on to the public hearing portion. Yes. Okay. All right. That sounds great. Ms. Drake, do you want to come in? Yes. So this is the time for members of the public who wish to speak on this item, the tiny homes um, study session to raise their hand um, using the hand icon on the Teams app or to press um, star nine on your telephone to remotely raise your hand. And I'm seeing a number of folks with their hands raised, so I'll just start at the top here. I'm seeing a participant by the name of Turan McKinney. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hi, thanks. My name is Turan McKinney. And just to clarify some of the questions that the group brought up, 13.6 is the height that you're going to hit a bridge when you're driving down the road. So 13.6 means that's where the lowest bridges are in general. That's why they have that. I believe that's why they have that height. Um, first of all, I want to thank the thank you, Daisy, for doing all of this work. I agree with most of almost all of the staff recommendations, with a couple of exceptions um, regarding utilities. You know, these tiny homes are hooked up just like an RV, so you get the water from the hose from the house that you're parked nearby. Um, same with the electricity. You usually have a 30 or 50 amp. Um, panel that you plug into, and that's RV standard, RVIA standard, and that's what these are following. I support having um, the ANSI regulations instead of having building code. Um, we have to remember that this is really about cost and scarcity. So the more regulations that we start out with, the more expensive it's going to end up being, and the more people are not going to be able, more people are not going to be able to avail themselves of this. So um, regarding um, Regarding the um, septic issue, which is my huge, which is near and dear to my heart, I'm curious as to how, how, how will the capacity of septic systems be calculated? Because for rural homeowners like myself, it's a huge issue because environmental health likes us to all have enhanced septic systems, which are 50, 60, $70,000, and that's not tenable for many, many people. The composting toilet self-contained in the tiny home composting toilet idea is really appealing, but how is that gonna, if you have your own system and it's sufficient for your own house and your composting toilet using tiny home tenant say, um, is adding, is not adding to that, how is that gonna be calculated? I guess that, I didn't say that very well, but I hope you understand what I mean. Um, and regarding maintenance, the issue of maintenance, you know, every year I have to do a backflow testing and it's a one page, filled out by the backflow testing person. And we could have the maintenance checked off on a one page sheet by a licensed contractor or a licensed home inspector. They can go through the unit, they can check that it's safe and sound and send that into the county so that staff isn't recruited to do that job. Um, other than that, I have, I'm running out of time, but um, I really just wanna make sure that you guys know how grateful we are that I am, that you guys have done the work to do this. And to please bear in mind the cost to the homeowner and to the dweller of regulation and overregulation. Better that we start out with minimal and add as we see fit later than start out overly regulated and then nobody goes anywhere and nothing gets done. Okay, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. All right, I am seeing a hand raised by a gentleman by the name of Todd Marco. Good morning, Todd. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hi, my name is Todd Marco. I'm executive director of Nicene Rio Gateway in Aptos. We are a local, a new local community nonprofit focused primarily on parks and transportation. Since equitable access to parks and transportation is interconnected with equitable housing, I'm highly supportive of these proposals. Given the importance of encouraging public transportation and active transportation as an alternative to single occupant vehicle use, I'm hoping that exceptions to or easing of parking restrictions will be allowed for parcels in close proximity to business centers and public transit options. In other words, in primarily urban, suburban, and exurban areas. 
It's important to remember that some of the people most in need of affordable housing are the same people most impacted by the high cost of automobile use and ownership. Thank you. Thanks. All right, and next we'll go to Vicki Hinckley. Good morning, Vicki. You have three minutes. Please state your name for the record. Unmuted. Hi, thanks. My name is Vicki Hinckley. I submitted uh, the survey and I sub oh, there's my first grade picture. Oh my God. Um, I submitted uh, comments to the commissioners. Um, re to reiterate quickly, um, the foundations for a tiny home on wheel apparently is zero. I guess people put them on jacks. I don't have one uh, and tie them down, you know, bungee cords, I don't know. But, it, it, and I know that was mentioned as something to look into, but what about a tiny home not on wheels, like a container house, a cargo house? I have one of those in Washington. It's literally a camp house. It's not, you know, what I would build here for a residence, but a cargo house, a container house, what, what foundation is required for that? It seems it defaults to like an ADU on a foundation for lack of any other uh, regulations, right? But I submit that a, a couple of 40 foot container houses, of course, dolled up to look just like all these other cute little tiny homes um, is more stable than a, than a throw uh, or a tow, <laughs> the tiny home on wheels, right? Um, uh, that isn't really attached to anything with any significant security. Picture, you know, container lots, uh, yards uh, at the bay, you know, in Oakland, in San Francisco, anywhere. They're stacked five high and they don't go flying off and hitting neighboring residents or businesses, you know, willy nilly. So anyway, uh, that's one Thing I'd like to see addressed. The other thing is uh, reiterating the, the prior comments about the septic. So picture the, the scenario, tiny house in the woods. I would love to have a tiny house in the woods, but I cannot put in a septic system, not to mention maybe the little bit of uh, <laughs> dirt I've acquired isn't suitable for septic. There's plenty of that, right? So the perfect scenario is that, you know, the composting toilet or the incinolet or rent, whatever it's called. Um, so I, I would really, and it sounds like you said that maybe those are state rules, but anyway, um, I, it seems like that really needs to be looked at further. Maybe you can't do it for this first rollout, but seriously, that's what the composting toilets are, are here for. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We'll now hear from Jeffrey Ellis. Good morning, Jeffrey. You have three minutes. Please restate your name for the record. Jeffrey? You need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Uh, good morning, my name is Jeffrey Ellis. Um, I would like to see if this ordinance goes forward that it takes uh, neighborhood concerns and needs into account. Uh, it should not apply to the entire unincorporated area and, and and, and turn half the county in, in, into a trailer park. Um, we, we, we don't want this. Um, now, I, I know this because uh, one of these tiny homes showed up on Thurber Lane in Santa Cruz Gardens. Uh, it was parked on the street, which was totally illegal, but it sat there for months and months. Um, when I talked with my neighbors about it, the question was not, you know, is this a great thing, but how do we get rid of this? Uh, later on, it got moved to the guy's front lawn. 
Uh, it does not not seem to be there anymore. I'm not sure what happened to it. Um, what should happen is that uh, tiny homes should be allowed in areas where there is substantial neighborhood support for allowing them. And it, it should not be allowed in, in other neighborhoods. I mean, look, if CZU folks, you know, want these things, need these things, that's fine with me. But a lot of us don't want them. Now, as far as the distinction of real property versus personal property, uh, these things are personal property, which means they're going not real property. There's going to be no property tax. They're going to be freeloading off the rest of us uh, for paying for schools and roads and everything else. I mean, you know, low cost is great, but it needs, you know, costs need to be fairly attributed to and allocated to the people who live in a neighborhood. Uh, and it's not fair for me to have to pay property tax uh, for somebody else, somebody else's needs. So uh, I really appreciate it if you would look at the neighborhood needs and wishes and, and limit it to the neighborhoods that really want these things. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I am now seeing a hand raised by Kim Schultz. Good morning, Kim. Please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Good morning. My, yes, my name is Kim Schultz. I'm talking to you as a CZU property owner with great interest in this uh, measure because I've spent about, oh, between twenty dollars to $35,000 to reestablish utilities on the site and just last month received our temporary housing permit. Uh, and th th that money spent was to for the purpose of putting a tiny home on the property and living there while we go about rebuilding the permanent residence. And I, I want to first, I want to echo Chairman Gordon's comments, kicking this off of recognizing staff's effort to dealing with a gnarly issue. And I was very, uh, I, I was very excited to hear uh, that um, Recreational vehicles are very similar in function and operation to um, the other category of tiny homes, uh, with the one exception of design aesthetics. But then, as I read through the tra the staff report and uh, what was offered in the, um, the the presentation, were uh, objective standards which would, in effect preclude uh, recreational vehicles as tiny homes on wheels um, to the extent that things such as siding, roofing materials, pitched roofs, eaves are identified as required design elements. You certainly don't, that's not, that's something you don't have on a recreation vehicle. So in it, uh, but in which we chose to buy a recreational vehicle uh, based on an at our anecdotal research of uh, what would function and, and operate best over a prolonged period. And uh, so we opted for the RV. I, I think that there are other elements that could be added to the design um, standards that address some of the concerns that uh, are identified such as uh, porch, uh, porches, decking, fencing, landscaping to uh, protect the view shed, if you will, of the, of the surrounding neighborhood and community. And so strongly encourage that. And I think staff is on to a good subject um, about the renewal, renewal certification. And perhaps instead of every five years, it should be every three years um, so that you nip some potential issues in the bud uh, before they manifest themselves to be an eyesore um, and a health and safety concern. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm seeing 
a member, member of the public by the name of Ted Benhari. Um, good morning, Ted. Please restate your name for the record. You have three minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, Ted Benhari from the uh, Rural Bonnie Dune Association. I'd like to first say that uh, we feel very strongly that there should be emergency permits for CZU uh, fire victims and that they should be allowed uh, to get as many time extensions uh, on permits for having uh, mobile homes or RVs uh, and tiny homes uh, until they can get back to where they were before the fire and rebuilding their properties. Um, second thing I'd like to emphasize is that we need different standards uh, within the uh, urban services boundary and outside the urban services boundaries because there are very different situations there. Um, another thing is I'd like to ask who are the survey respondents? Um, do, we, uh, we didn't identify whether they're people who were uh, in rural areas, in the urban services boundary areas, and uh, it would be very uh, helpful for us to know uh, who uh, responded to all of those issues. Um, let's see, the other thing, I had a question about whether these uh, tiny homes would be physically inspected by uh, the county staff or you would just accept the plans or photographs. Uh, I think it's very important to have uh, physical inspections of the actual uh, buildings and of the location of the buildings and how they're hooked up to the services rather than just having uh, something brought to them on paper. Um, let's see what else. Uh, the property tax issues that were brought up earlier, I think that is uh, of paramount importance also. Um, it's uh, People should be paying for the same uh, services that uh, everybody else is paying for. I know the county has great financial issues with uh, money for roads and a whole bunch of other things. And we want to do everything to minimize that so that uh, those things should not be able to escape paying property taxes. Um, then uh, the last thing that I wanted to comment on is uh, that we don't want to see a situation where there are a bunch of hoses and electrical cables with all the possibilities for causing fires that they would bring and just septic hoses leaking and polluting the environment. There has to be some sort of permanent and safe utility uh, connections made for uh, any buildings or RVs or uh, tiny homes that are put on any properties. That's it. Thank you. All right, I am seeing a hand raised by Hallie Green. Good morning, Haley or Hallie. Um, will you please correct me with your name and you have a few minutes? Thank you. Yes, my name is Hallie Green. Um, I am part of the long-term recovery group and act as the vice chair for that entity. Um, so we've been working with a lot of fire survivors. Um, I myself am also a fire survivor. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> I just didn't see the time we're going. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for your consideration on moving this forward. Um, I not only think this is a great option for folks who are struggling to rebuild, um, I would love to encourage you to expedite something for CZU fire victims. Um, I also act as a local coordinator for United Policyholders, which is an advocacy group for um, insurance rights. Um, you may or may not know a lot of people will lo lose their assisted living expenses, which has been paying for many people's rental options, um, either at the end of this year in August. Um, if they get an extension, it would only extend them another year. So there will be a lot of people that have been assisted for these last year and a half and will not be in that situation coming up pretty quickly. So I would love to see if there's some options we can do to help expedite that process. Um, I also just really appreciate the work moving this forward. I am really concerned for our local communities and 
housing crisis, and I think options like this would be very beneficial. Um, I do understand the concerns. I live in a more rural area, um, and I do see that it can be very different here from down in Santa Cruz or Aptos areas. Um, but I, I would really think there'd be a good way to move this forward. Um, and again, just really appreciate your time and wanted to thank uh, everyone for putting this on the on the docket. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Holly. Um, all right, I'm seeing a hand raised from uh, by Michael Pisano. Good morning, Michael, or still morning? Ah, good afternoon, Michael. Do you have three minutes. Thank you very much. Um, two uh, two answers basically uh, on the height limit. Um, some of the uh, park RV units are, I think, might be a little bit taller than 13.6. Um, and what they'll do, they'll just drive around uh, the overpass um, as is done at you know several locations, like by the um, on Highway One where the some of the railroad crossings are. Uh, they'll just go around. And then there's uh, Marita Dunes RV Park has two uh, rentals that are park RV units, and one of them is standard height. But then the second one has a loft unit, especially some of the park RV that have loft units. They actually raised up the roof. They got a specialized contractor from down south that does these and actually raised the roof. So you can actually, uh, the loft goes from 50 inches to up to, I think, um, six feet so you can walk on the loft. And I lived in a park RV unit here on Commercial Way uh, in um, Live Oak um, for five or 10 years, and it was comfortable. And I did have the earthquake bracing. Um, they took off the wheels and put on 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 on, on jacks, so they had earthquake bracing that actually latched onto the the the, the frame um, and um, all that. But I think the park RV units are awesome, and to allow in the county is great. Um, with the hookups, I mean they're all standard RV hookups. You know, at all RV parks, and maybe something that like that could be figured out. And yeah, I'm disappointed too. I have many friends that are losing their FEMA funding and are trying desperately to get it extended. And basically um, what the uh, alleged, uh, anecdotally, the uh, FEMA person basically said, there's other disasters in, in, in the United States and they're going to be ending the funding because there's other disasters, which is, which is a shame. These people basically, um, you know, lost everything and it's very disheartening that the FEMA is just like um, walking away and saying sorry no more funding so thank you thank you all right and I'm seeing um, another member of the public here who wishes to speak Tim Richards good afternoon Tim you have three minutes please restate your name for the record as well Hey everyone, my name is Tim Richards. I'm, I own the business Philosopher Foods, hold three commercial leases at the old sash mill. And I just wanted to applaud the commissioners for bringing this important work uh, to become legislation. Um, Santa Cruz will be joining several other uh, cities and counties throughout the state of California that have legalized tiny homes on wheels as dwelling units. And I would just like to speak also as a property owner in Santa Cruz County. Um, we own some land up here in Bonnie Dune that was affected by the CZU fire. And I'm grateful that the county actually has legalized tiny homes on wheels already for uh, burn properties in the CZU complex. Um, however, it's only temporary housing that is currently legal. So I just wanted to say that if it's acceptable to legalize tiny homes on wheels for full-time occupation without a single residence in this area of the county, then I, I certainly don't see any reason why it shouldn't be occupied, uh, legalized for full-time occupation elsewhere in the county. Um, so I'm actually personally considering whether or not to build a tiny home on wheels right now on our property because we don't have any structures. They all burned down in the fire. And I want to know that I, my investment will be safe if I do choose to build a tiny home on wheels here on our property. Um, I don't want to find out that after I get my temporary housing permit in three years, then it's going to be illegal and we're going to get red tagged to have something that's currently legal. 
So to me, it's a logical inconsistency. Um, I think that you should definitely move to legalize the full extent of tiny home occupation that you're considering, which is not just as an ADU, but also as a full-time standalone dwelling. And not to do so, I think, would be inconsiderate of those who have lost in the fire, as well as those who struggle financially to afford housing in this county. Um, and even as a business owner, I've been here since 2015, my family and I struggle to afford housing. We're paying $2,200 a month just to live on this land that has nothing on it after the fire. And if we were gonna build on foundation, even a 900 square foot house would cost us $4,500 a month for a mortgage. We also don't feel safe to build on foundation yet. Um, even though one fire came through, it doesn't mean another is not going to. Um, so I think it's, it's unrealistic and unfair and actually lacks compassion to force people to build on foundation after a fire. Um, so again, I'm really grateful for everything that you're doing to legalize these units. Um, and I would also echo the call to legalize composting toilets as well. It doesn't make sense to have tiny homes as affordable housing if you're forced to get a $60,000 septic system, which is actually more than the price of a tiny home to begin with. So thank you for your time and for your consideration. Thank you. All right. Um, just want to remind folks if they wish to speak on this item, the tiny home ordinance study session to raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone or raise it, um, use the hand icon on the Zoom app to uh, make yourself known if you're participating via Zoom. I'm seeing um, hand raised by um, Teron McKinney. I can't recall. Um, Teron, have we heard from you yet? I believe that was the first call. Yes, you have. I was the first per person. I had a, just a quick comment, if that's okay. Um, only if allowed by the chair, we only allow um, one round of you know comments per person. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate. If, you know, we have a lot to get through. Let's let's stick to that. Um, okay. Thank you. Great. I am seeing one final um, caller here um, that just raised their hand, Joshua Engberg. Good morning or good afternoon, Joshua. Will you please uh, restate your name for the record? You have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joshua Engberg. I am the owner of a business called Tiny House Basics. Uh, we build tiny house trailers since 2015, and we build about 450 trailers a year uh, for people all over the United States. Um, we are based just outside of Santa Cruz County, but I have a big passion for the county because I have a lot of clients and customers and understand their unique situations with living uh, tiny or trying to find very affordable um, housing situations. Um, since 2015, uh, we built many tiny house trailers for people to build their own tiny houses on. We really try to empower people to do that. Um, and also many full tiny houses uh, for customers and clients in Santa Cruz County. Um, first off, I just want to thank everybody uh, so much for moving forward with this and just um, just a very thorough um, research and reaching out to the community for their thoughts and uh, feelings on it. Um, I wanted to clarify a couple things. Height restrictions um, is 13 feet, five inches from the ground to the top of the house for most states in the United States. Uh, California is actually unique where they allow uh, 14 feet high and that's actually regulated by the DOT. Um, and actually most Western um, states are 14 feet. Um, and the permit actually goes via the DOT and not um, the DMV. Uh, earthquake tie downs, um, since tiny houses are on, are on wheels, very resilient to earthquakes. Um, I myself and my wife have lived in a tiny house for eight plus years in the East Bay, um, been through a couple earthquakes. Tie downs aren't usually an issue, um, but they definitely can be added on the trailer and um, you know if that's required. Um, Tiny house owners have very immense pride in their homes. Uh, so upkeep, I don't think is ever usually an issue, but I like that kind of yearly inspection with a contractor. That sounds very good. Most people are really having higher quality builds in smaller spaces. So it's definitely a total difference uh, than RVs. I'd also like the discussion to maybe talk about grandfathering in 
tiny houses on wheels for people that are already in Santa Cruz County. I mean, we have some customers that have built tiny houses on wheels, living on family's property, and they've been there for five plus years now. I'd also like to maybe discuss other septic alternatives, like maybe macerating tanks uh, or something that the ability that people in rural land where they don't have access to septic, um, they could have trucks that come in and kind of pump out the sewage. But but I think the general rule of thumb is that tiny house owners have a very, you know, they want to follow the rules and they, but they they have a desire for affordable housing. And um, yeah, so I'm out of time, but thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you. All right, last call for speakers who have not had a chance to address the Planning Commission. Um, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand or press this, the hand icon on your Zoom app if you would like to provide comment. Sorry. Okay, I am not seeing any additional speakers at this time. Chair, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Appreciate it. So then we will definitely close the public comment at this time and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Um, I'd like to see if we can start briefly with just a few of the questions that were raised by the public so that, you know, if they just needed that quick answer and were, you know, needed to move on that we could get that to them. Um, I think there's only a few and Daisy, I'm sure you're taking notes, but I have them as well. Um, is there anything specific that you'd like to answer right now, Daisy? That's maybe um, not packet or could be a quick answer. Sure. Yeah, I can go through my notes here. Um, so there was a question about um, how capacity of septic systems might be calculated for tiny homes on wheels and how that might be, for instance, different from tiny homes on foundations. We did hear from uh, environmental health staff um, at the community meetings um, on this issue. Um, based on new um, state and local regulations, um, uh, uh, something called the LAMP, which is the Local Area Management Plan, um, and associated uh, county code updates. My understanding is that uh, property owners will have the option of calculating capacity based on actual flow uh, measurements. Um, so that may um, enable uh, tiny homes to uh, have lower capacity kind of uh, requirements as compared to you know larger homes on foundations. Um, and uh, uh, we can get more information from environmental health on that question as well. Um, and Let's see, going through my questions here. Um, uh, uh, can other elements be added to the design requirements to address community concerns, such as porches, landscaping, and screening? Um, certainly, the commission could cons consider that. Um, uh, uh, there's a question about who are the survey respondents. Um, that participated in the online survey. It wasn't on. It's an anonymous survey, um, so we we don't know. Um, but the survey has been posted um, on the planning department website since early December. Uh, it's been um, advertised through the Santa Cruz County Facebook, Twitter, and Nextdoor, um, and through um, staff uh, emails uh, to the community um, uh, in a, in advance of public uh, meetings. Um, so that's how the word has gotten out about the survey, and we do have over 350 respondents so far. Um, there's a question about physically inspecting tiny homes on wheels, um, and that certainly could be incorporated um, into the requirements um, for tiny homes on wheels that are certified through, you know, ANSI or NIFA. Um, there are certification um, um, entities that would uh, uh, verify um, compliance for the tiny home itself, um, but there could be county staff work involved with um, actually verifying that the tiny home is located and connected on site. Um, so that's something we could incorporate. Um, I think those 
were the main questions that I, I jotted down. The one that I had that might not be necessarily um, in the packet, kind of like the difference between RVs and tiny homes, you know, and like people want to know, can they just use an RV or not? And maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Um, sure, yeah. So like I said in my presentation, um, you know, uh, the... Uh, for, what, for what most jurisdictions are requiring for tiny homes on wheels in terms of approvals um, it is really, you know, what we already have as requirements for RVs um, and park trailers. So this ANSI or NIFBA certification, those are RV certifications. Um, now, in addition to that, um, most jurisdictions also are requiring um, uh, compliance with some objective design standards um, that would um, preclude RVs from being classified as tiny homes on wheels. So the standards would include, you know, residential building materials, you know, windows that are residential, you know, windows with trim. Um, so those those kinds of requirements. Um, and certainly the county could consider, um, you know, not having those types of design requirements as part of our ordinance. To my knowledge, um, the only kind of local jurisdiction that is allowing that is um, Oakland. Great, thank you. Um, I think you you hit all the ones that I had kind of written down as uh, easy answers for the public. So I appreciate that. Um, why don't we go to the rest of the commission? And you know, I think it probably be easiest if we did kind of go section by section and you know, discuss your opinions and, and make some recommendations on each section and move forward from there. If that sounds good to the commissioners, try and keep it a little bit structured as it's kind of a, uh, a lot to get through. Um, if that works for everyone, then I'd love to let, you know, whoever is ready to start. Um, Chair, Please, Commissioner um, I have a question that is not in the, in the report. Yes. So could I ask that question Absolutely. quickly of staff? Yes. I was just curious if these units will count towards our regional housing needs allocation. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you know, that's a question that staff had as well. And my understanding after um, talking with uh, representatives from other jurisdictions is that um, HCD has allowed, it, so the, the State Department of Housing and Community Development has allowed tiny homes on wheels to count. Towards Rena. That is wonderful news. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the state requirement just has the county provide access or, you know, make the ability to build something available. The county's not going to build tiny homes. So it's not the same. The housing requirement is not that we have the county's supposed to build them, they're just supposed to make zoning available for them. So I'm not sure how you would. Daisy, how could you use the fact that they would count since you have, there's, how do you do that? Um, yeah, so, so the regional housing needs assessment is a requirement for a total number of housing units that the county needs to provide for um, every eight years. Um, and, uh, and then every year during that eight year cycle, we provide an annual progress report to the state um, reporting um, exactly how many units um, were constructed um, in the county, uh, 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 kind of slice that we slice and dice the, da the data a few different ways, provide information on um, affordability of the units, that kind of thing. So um, we would be able to report um, tiny home on wheels uh, permits towards those yearly totals that we provide to HCD. So that's in a in the usual usual way it's say, okay, well, this is now zoned for this many units, and that's how they read our compliance on zoning issues, right? Uh, yeah, well, there's sort of, so there's one issue, which is compliance with the RENA in our housing element, which is, you know, chapter four of our general plan. Um, and so that's where we say, you know, that's where we demonstrate that we have capacity for the number of housing units that were provided to, that were required to provide. Um, and then every year we report the actual building permits um, to the state of actual housing that's been um, permitted and constructed. So progress towards meeting that overall housing goal. 
you know where in the income range the the tiny homes would apply? Um, you know, we probably uh, calculate that similarly to how we calculate uh, income for or the income uh, assumed income range for ADUs, which is based on the size of the unit and comparable kind of rental rates that we see in the market. Um, so uh, for ADUs, it's usually moderate income uh, is what's reported. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Jocelyn, I see that Paya has joined and her hand raised. Maybe she had something to mention there. Absolutely. Paya, thank you. Good morning. Um, and thank you, Daisy, for that information. And I wanted to add that um, we will be discussing this more with HCD going forward because we're gearing up now for the next housing uh, element cycle. And staff will be doing that work uh, next year. Um, and HCD has not landed very specifically, at least not in the way they shared with us, on how they will count um, tiny homes on wheels. Where tiny homes are on foundations, they will count as units. And we are anticipating that we'll put them in the same income category that we did ADU. So Daisy's perfectly correct about that. Um, I just wanted to make sure that um, um, to, to say that I, I, I don't know that we have a final word for us for next cycle on how they will count the ones on wheels as far as units produced in the community. Um, and we'll be getting more information about all of that um, as HCD is um, making their determinations because they also are still working on how they will review the housing elements that they get in the next cycle. So thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, okay, let's try this. And obviously it's gonna, you know, it's, there's a lot that kind of goes back and forth here between sections, but maybe we can start with just the first topic where we're making recommendations is the geographic location um, and see if uh, we can get through this uh, in some kind of order here. Um, did any commissioners wanna start on that topic in particular? Well. Um, I think that we also should disallow areas where access roads don't meet fire standards, like Placer County. That makes sense to me. I agree with that. And I think they should be allowed where um, residential land use is allowed, not in other segments when we talk about later in another iteration about allowing them in larger groups, that's when we could talk about allowing them on church property and so on. But right now, I think we got to start by sifting to where residential development is already allowed. I would agree that with staff's recommendation, but I would like to discuss at some point those areas that are designated as coastal zone. Um, and perhaps special considerations for those neighborhoods. Uh, well, yeah, I had a note about that too. And I really think there might be different needs and different consideration as we have in most ordinances for the county between the rural areas and the urban areas. We might want to allow different, slightly different um, it, the ordinance could vary between those two big area, those two, that's the way we bifurcate the county in almost every other um, development regulation. And I see no reason why this should be different. It gives us much more freedom to do what's appropriate in urban areas and rural areas, yeah, which I as we know, have different water uh, availability, different kinds of roads and accessibility, which just makes sense to me. Yeah, if I may, I would even suggest three bifurcating it in three ways based on past experience, the rural services line, urban services line, and the coastal zone. Awesome. And the coastal zone, just with regard to parking, because we we I'm gonna take a wild guess that the coastal commission staff is going to um, push back against us that we'll do anything to take away parking for coastal areas. 
I would agree. I think those three designations, how we've looked at all development issues, and I see no reason that they should be any different. I think we'll get a better ordinance if we do that. Okay, one down. Almost, I have one question there, sorry. Um, how does it relate to like, like C1 lot, zone lot, where residential is allowed? Um, just to confirm like that and like the multifamily zone. So multifamily zoning, essentially we could build as many as would normally fit in that multifamily zone in this ordinance and commercially zone lots, you know, you can create residential units. Um, just confirming that that means that these could be used on those parcels as well. Yeah, so thank you for that um, clarification. So that is what staff would be proposing here, um, but the commission may want to discuss that further. Um, so currently, um, uh, we have certain densities that we, re you know, require on multifamily lots. So the tiny home, on, tiny homes on wheels would be subject to the same density requirements, and then, um, and and ADU requirements associated with multifamily properties, and then for um, C1, C2, and PA, which are the commercial zone districts that allow um, mixed use. Uh, we have a density, um, it's our maximum uh, multifamily density on those lots. Okay, thank you. I feel like that is appropriate and um, is in line with what you've proposed, so thank you. Okay, can, that's, it is almost 12.30. I have to leave it going and we can move ourselves along. Uh, yeah, it is, if anyone else has any item, things on item number on geographic location. Yes, Commissioner Lazen. You couldn't see my little hand. Sorry. Um, it's it's yeah, okay. Sorry. No, I just have a, a question with regard to geographic areas and anything that is zoned residential, that would take into consideration, I would think, the CZU fire areas. Is there any consideration for fast tracking regulations for tiny homes rebuilding in the CZU fire scars? Because as one of our um, respondents had said that, um, you know, they had already purchased an RV and that wasn't gonna qualify my understanding. So is there any consideration we can give them for preliminary regulations that they can meet. Um, yeah, actually at the conclusion of this discussion, I was gonna bring up um, the proposal to expedite um, permitting for um, tiny homes in the CZU burn area and have a little brief discussion about that. So uh, if that's... Well, I think that's appropriate, but I think we ought to let staff work on it and come back to us with it. Well, this is a study agreed. session. Agreed. I just was going to put forth a, an idea. I mean, I can articulate it now, but I figure we should just go through what's outlined in the staff report and then anything in addition to what's in the staff report we can um, bring up at the end. Agreed. <clears throat> um, Paya joined there again. Did you have something to chime in on that point, Paya? Or Jocelyn, can you, thank you. Um, yes, just briefly, um, I uh, any discussion um, about the CZU area, I just want to be sure that the public hears that you are currently allowed to be in um, a tiny home, an RV, um, a modified previously non-habitable structure, whatever it is you can come up with. Um, on a temporary basis for three years with some, we have some basic safety checks that have to happen first, but there is provision for that. And I wanna make sure that people know they can come in and take advantage of that because we certainly encourage getting people situated um, because they need a place to be and while they're building a permanent home. Yeah, thank you, Paya, that's right. Great clarification, thank you. Um, um, configuration then, did anyone have some thoughts on the configuration section and number of tiny homes? Yeah, so in general, the first paragraph of the staff recommendation I think is fine. Basically, it's just saying as it can count as one of the ADUs or primary dwellings. Um, so I'm fine with that. I think the third paragraph um, 
is getting into what Daisy and staff are going to have to dig into a little bit more before we see this again and um, trying to figure out how this primary calling a, a tiny home a primary dwelling um, squares with state housing law, building code, property tax status, all that. So, <laughs> right? Yeah, that was a, that really stopped me cold too because it um, sounds like this is still needing to be looked at to see if we can consider them primary homes since the other two jurisdictions thought not. So this is why this is a study session because there still seems to be a lot of stuff we really don't know yet. Um, I would like to understand a little bit on this one about the allowing multiple tiny homes as like a, a group essentially. So a bed and or like a bedroom in one and a kitchen in another. Um, as long as if we're tying everything to ADU standards and single family home standards for things like FAR and all that kind of stuff, it would seem like it wouldn't it would be possible at this point to allow multiple units to and multiple tiny homes to combine to a single unit. Um, and I just want to understand if that's something that's, you know, it's mentioned in the second paragraph to push that off to another policy, but it could make a difference now if, if um, it was something that we could easily figure out. But I just like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, sure. Yeah. So we did hear from at least one member of the community that um, one solution they were considering for their family was to, instead of building a home on a foundation, have several tiny homes, but have them combine to just serve one family and really be separate structures that function as one house together with um, one of them having a kitchen, another one being bedrooms, it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's, uh, a, it's a really interesting idea. Um, uh, and certainly the commission could consider it. I think um, from a staff perspective, it, it could be a potential code enforcement issue if we were to allow that. And it might be very easy to modify um, a tiny home on wheels, for instance, that didn't have a kitchen to then add a kitchen or um, to then have that become a separate dwelling. And then you get into a situation where you've got more density than would otherwise be allowed um, on the parcel. Um, so I think that's why staff sort of um, stopped short of recommending that, but it's certainly an interesting idea. And it, it also um, is a really um, great way to provide flexibility um, for uh, property owners, especially those people rebuilding um, after the fire. Thank you. I, I definitely understand that it can be challenging. I'd just like to think about both sides here. It's anyone could just go build onto their house without a permit or buy a tiny home and just put in their yard without a permit, right? I mean, people, it happens. Um, I hate to preclude stuff based on the idea that people might do something wrong um, as opposed to maybe incentivizing them to do it right. So for example, if you went to, if you're going to use this as a single family home, you know, you might want to have two bedrooms, right? Which is not going to be possible in a tiny home. So, you know, if it's permitted and goes through the process appropriately, there it might you might have the opportunity to allow those without um, too much challenge and maybe even prevent people from saying, "Well, I got one. I'm just going to bring another one in." Um, just a thought. It, I, it would I would uh, think that it it would be good at this point to at least investigate um, <clears throat> and think about what. You know, you know, think about if it's possible or would really work and just really think through that because, you know, kind of now is the, the time. Um, well, I that's would, the only uh, comment that I had on that section. Go ahead. Sorry, Commissioner. I, I would just add on to that. If you are going to study that, then I would also like to know how we would assess those tiny homes. So if it's in lieu of a house on a foundation, but it's on a property with water, with septic, and we're just going to put a bunch of tiny homes there that are going to be used using the, the roads, the schools, the services. How are they going to be assessed? And that, that's something critical I think we need to keep in mind. I agree with that 100%. 
Okay, development standards? Yeah, uh, let's move on. Um, does any commissioner I'll, want to take a I'll a go staff? first. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I'm fine with the staff recommendation, except I'm a little bit wary of the of putting, at least starting out, allowing them in driveways. From my experience, that has been um, the, the time when I have heard negativity about um, RVs, tiny homes on wheels. So, yeah, that's what I would suggest. I agree 100% with uh, Commissioner Dan. Um, I'm very concerned about the driveway issue. Can I ask on that one in particular, just thinking through, you know, if um, you have a larger lot and how, and the house is set really far back, the driveway would potentially be appropriate. But, you know, I think what we're all envisioning in our head is driving down like, you know, a tight, like Live Oak or see right, kind of like a neighborhood and there's just tiny homes in every single driveway. I think that's what the, you know, where it will get really sticky, right? Um, there mm -hmm. might be instances where it would be appropriate, but is there a way to, to really? Well, know, we could develop different standards. Like, so we could say in the rural service, outside the urban services line, under these circumstances, I think Daisy kind of outlined certain circumstances where it might not cause neighborhood issues. Um, you know, I'd be open to considering that. I think that makes sense. I think the um, example of a long driveway um, in a rural area. Um, so I, I would support an exception for the rural areas. Um, in rural areas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a tricky one. You know, it's hard. It's to, hard because you know, yeah, Boulder Creek could could be the same live oak situation that you described. So. Yeah, the staff could add something related to screening or visibility from a public road. Yeah. Or additional distance beyond the front setback distance, mm -hmm. or you know, there's a variety of kind of things that we could add to the code in mm -hmm. addition to just allowing it outside the USL. Mm -hmm. I think that the front setback part of it is is something that we, you know, we'll need to remember in this because technically if you're following ADU standards, you're not building within the front yard setback, right? So you're right. still on average and 20 feet. It's usually about 20 feet. Yeah. Okay. So that usually pushes most ADUs are going to be in your side or rear yard. So maybe that problem is actually already solved without having to do a ton more work. Potentially, still something to think about. Um, I had a couple questions in this section regarding parking and then, then just a note on setbacks and stuff. One thing um, in particular on setbacks and just this whole process in general that the community might, you know, benefit from hearing is that a lot of, a lot of regulations are not set up to be restrictive necessarily on housing and, and new homes. A lot of the, like a setback, for example, is is primarily there to prevent spread of fire from one building to another. Like where <clears throat> someone may think I can just park this it's a smaller unit, I should just be able to park it, you know, wherever I want. It does really pose a risk for, for the community in general. Another one is like we mentioned fire access roads. If you don't have access to a site or the fire department doesn't, right? They're gonna come save you in an emergency. So, but it, it, it's really hard for them to get there causes a lot of problems. Um, so I just want, you know, everyone, the public that's still on to just to remember that there's a lot of these regulations that are set up for public safety um, and some that wouldn't be like maybe as um, good of an idea to remove. So I, I'd be in favor of keeping the setbacks and um, based on what the ADU standards are right now. I think that that, <clears throat> that does make sense. And um, just a note there, and then I guess my question on parking, this came up a little bit earlier, but I, I don't know that it will be really easily solved. We can allow conversion ADUs that, <clears throat> excuse me, do not require parking. Is that correct? Um, yes, that is correct. Um, mm -hmm. But tiny homes on wheels would be, you know, they would be like detached ADUs. Um, mm -hmm. The, but we do not require parking for de detached ADUs um, in some areas, uh, for instance, or you know, near to uh, 
transit um, uh, right. uh, stops. So you might not require parking for it. That'll be based on the ADU standards. But then replacement parking is so you can convert a garage and you don't have to create replacement parking, right? But this would be separate. This would be like a new structure, separate ADU regulations. Okay. Right. Yeah, it would be like a detached, like a new detached ADU. Uh, I think we have to consider parking and maybe you want to consider it differently for within the urban service lines outside of the coastal zone because in the rural area, they're going to have a car. There's no other way to get around really. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's bus routes, but they don't go in very remote places. Um, and I, I think you'll need to work on these regulations about parking and driveways, which you're going to have to build a case for me. I just it's it's kind of vague what I mean that's going to be take some time and effort on your part to say well you can have it in a driveway as, as long as it doesn't park the block the main hut um, and that's that's a little subjective and also there's so many homes with cul-de-sacs I think that is a neighborhood issue too and then there's a capacity issue and then how many people have in nice weather people are going to be outside so you're there's, you know, there's a lot of issues around that. I, I'm interested to see what you come up with. I really don't know what would work, and it may be different for urban or rural or coastal zone. I mean, the one time I brought it up, um, you know, a long road with many homes and a cul-de-sac, they all blanched. So it'll have to be thought through carefully. Agreed. There's okay. one last question I had. On, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go for it. Okay. Um, what, there's a note in the in some of the comments from the, I assume it's the public hearings um, or the community meetings, rather. Uh, the fire department was mentioning that, and this is typical on ADUs, garage conversions and such, that you need to be able to see uh, the unit. You need to know it's there. You got to be able to see the address number, that kind of um, issue. So I just wanted to understand if there is an option or something that you could research where if we're putting a tiny home, it's a lot smaller, it's maybe a, lot, maybe a little bit more challenging to be visible from the street. Is there another option where there's a post or, a, you know, something at the front of the lot that would convey to the fire department that there is a unit back there in case of an emergency, but maybe not necessarily require the the address to be visible, you know, maybe there's some middle ground that, because I think that could be a challenging conclusion to work. Well, I would say that the fire officials need to sign off on this ordinance and they need to weigh in on any issues that concern access or visibility for sure. Um, yeah, and I would just add that we are coordinating with fire district staff um, as we're working on this, and they they did attend the community meetings. Um, and in terms of addressing, my understanding is the the comment from the fire district staff was that um, the address would need to be visible, not necessarily the tiny home itself. Okay. So perhaps that could be on a post or you know not on the home itself. Yeah. Or I, yeah, I'm not sure exactly, but we can definitely get more clarity and specificity on that from fire district staff. Yeah, I, I think there's a picture on page 133, which I think is from a builder of, of uh, tiny homes that you put in there, but it's very romantic. It shows a really cute little tiny homes tucked right into the trees. And there's a tree, like two or three, there's a bunch of trees. It's in the middle of the forest. And I need to see what, I would want to see what the fire district thinks of that concept. That's why I'm concerned about setbacks. So I, I want to make sure these are really safe for people. Any other comments on that section? Move on. Great. Uh, um, well, I think that was the show. Was oh, we're in, up to ownership now? No, we're at um, home design. Home design. Um, on this one, I, I. I'm fine with this, what the staff recommends. The same one. I don't have anything there. Um, of course, I have some thoughts. Um, try and keep them quick. So, 
I think that the there's there's a couple things that I think are a little bit of a challenge just because of the construction types these days, like mechanical mechanical equipment not being um, on the exterior can be a challenge for heating, especially for water and air. Um, those units will typically have an exterior mounted structure. And I think that there are a lot of pictures where it was like, where it was visible, but it wasn't, you know, didn't look terrible. So I don't know that that would be a really good one to force on people because it can create a, in a actually a more cost prohibitive approach to construction of these and take some square footage that would otherwise be living space. I would agree with you, but if we're going to allow people to put them in driveways, then these these issues become a matter of community concern. So you got two things playing off each other. We're going to have to think through that in the process. Maybe there's a way to put them. You know, there one of the pictures had it kind of like tucked away, like or on the roof, where it's maybe not as visible or something like that. But you, if you so, if you do a mini split unit for heating, you you got to have the unit outside to heat that space. So that's like, you know, that would preclude a lot of like current technology, which is all really moving that direction, especially like solar panels and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, electric system would primarily use a mini split, which would need an exterior unit. So I don't think we can preclude it, but maybe there's a way to shield it. How about some language that it needs to be screened? Yeah, thank you. And staff can also check in with staff from some of the other jurisdictions to understand a little bit more about how that aspect of the these other ordinances is is going in implementation because it it has been incorporated in every every ordinance that we've we've seen. But I, you know, I I don't know um, exactly how you know staff at those jurisdictions have interpreted you know different mechanical systems. Okay. The only other one that I wasn't really like super keen on is requiring exterior trim on windows. If you did like a metal panel siding, which we've seen like some cool modern, like neat looking tiny homes, you know, they don't always have trim. I think the idea is to make it look more like a house and less like a vehicle, right? Yeah. So yes. I don't think that I would I would be in favor of removing that because I don't think that's the one thing that's gonna change it. And it kind of we precludes say, these things. We could say exterior trim or other design features to mimic when, like, you know, right? Something like that to get out yeah. of what you're doing, your trim. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's it for me on that one. Thank you. Anyone else on that topic? Okay. Let's see. Where are we at? I think utilities. we're on the fun one, utilities. Yeah, that's going to be a good yeah. one. Well, I think we need a lot more study in this area. It's a, and there, again, things might be different for, definitely would be different for coastal, urban, and rural. I want to know more about backup systems, what's available, and so on. You know, I looked up what tiny homes cost to buy, and it's anywhere from like 30000 up. So say thirty to sixty, and you can easily have 100000 dollar one if you want a super deluxe, but um, you got to see what the backup systems are going to um, add and what the requirements are. Um, and that's where the difference, these are going to be permanent homes. So you really got to look very carefully into water needs beside compost and toilets. Where, what about the gray water system, uh, you know, for bath water, kitchen water? I mean, that all needs to be figured out and we haven't looked at that. Um, so I want to know about, you know, septic systems, gray water systems, water accessibility, the requirements for backup. And I'm sure that that can be different between rural and urban areas, for example. And, and I was more specific earlier, you know, will they need a will serve letter? Do they need to, you know, what, what will they need uh, to do this? Um, so I think we need more information there. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, uh, staff uh, definitely needs to do more work on this, agreed. And um, in terms of the backup systems, um, 
in the rural area, it's really going to be coordination with environmental health staff and fully understanding the state law requirements and our local code, what our local code can allow um, legally um, and incorporating that into the code so we can work closely with uh, Marilyn Underwood and, and her staff there at environmental yeah, health. You know, fire safe, landscaping, all the other things that regular, you know, I guess they're called sick homes have to think about how do they apply to, to these. I don't really think we want to see a cute little home nestled in the redwoods. Um, that really wouldn't work. Not as much as it's cute, but it, that's a camping situation, not a permanent home. That's, so we're, you know. anyway, I think that needs that needs some more work, and you're good at that. I agree with that. I also want would like a little bit more information of how what the mechanisms are and how what the aesthetics would be of the hookups themselves. Imagine there's going to be hoses and pipe or pipes, maybe. I'm not familiar with what's usually the materials used to hook up to a water system in the single family home or, or the, the sewer piping. Um, so what that looks like, how it's, if it's just going to go along the backyard and has to be buried or, so that would be helpful for me. Um, I, there's two other things. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, one more thing. If, if you have an off-grid electric system, there's still permits involved there. Would these be subject to those? There's setbacks for permanent germ generators. In other words, what part, what kinds of things will be in place to ensure health and safety? That's all. Because you want these to really be permanently there, not just glorified RVs. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention too is, um, you know, California building codes, like really leaning, everywhere is leaning towards all electric units, right? And so, um, I think it kind of goes to the last statement, but we should definitely allow solar on top of the tiny home, in my opinion. That way, you know, if they didn't have to have a whole grid somewhere, the tiny home is oftentimes able to be run just on the solar that it would have on its own roof. Um, I think that would be really beneficial. I'm concerned about uh, generators. You know, so oftentimes we've been to an RV park or any, you know, been camping in RVs next to you and there's, you know, they may have solar or may not, but then we'll, you know, kick on that generator for a few hours every day to power the batteries that run the tiny home. In an off-grid situation, that can be challenging, especially say we're in town where generators aren't as, you know, common, uh, you know, in rural, rural areas, power goes out, people kick on the generators, makes sense. If that's, you know, if someone, if there's like a row of tiny homes in everyone's backyards and they kick on those generators at seven in the morning, it might be a challenge. So maybe we just restrict generators completely. It's all electric. I'm not sure. If it's all electric and we don't have generators, then they're all going to have to spend a lot of thousand dollars to get the battery storage because that technology is just still emerging. But anyway, this all, can, all needs to be looked at for sure. Yes, a row of tiny homes, each with their own generator, then you'd have really, it would be deafening. <laughs> Big problems. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. another thing about putting them, you know, you'd have to hook up to a house's power system. So would you allow a generator for the tiny home in the house whose driveway it sits on? And what would that do to the neighbor's noise level? Mm -hmm. The generators are, you know, I, I, I built out a couple, like I built out a sprinter and have, um, you know, another little camper thing that we've hooked up solar to. And the, the generator is necessary to power batteries if you don't have solar in these kind of scenarios, at least in my experience. And so the batteries are expensive, but it's already part of the equation. The generator is additional on top of it to power those batteries in case you don't have shore power or solar to make up for it. So if we're saying that you have to have electric service anyway, the only time you should really, which is like the shore power, the only time you should really need a generator is if you don't have access to shore power because it went out or you're in the woods or something like that. Um, 
And, and so I think it could be restricted without adding cost. Um, how, however, you know, I'm not an expert at this. So yeah, Daisy, maybe you can continue to dig into that. Sure, yeah, and I would say I'm, I'm not an expert in this particular subject either. Um, I will just add that we did hear feedback from the community that they were concerned about allowing generators as part of this ordinance and that there was more interest in just um, allowing for 100% uh, renewable um, off-grid electric systems. Um, uh, so that's that's the feedback we've we've received from the community so far on that that topic. It's going to be hard to enforce. Yeah. Uh, last question on is joint or separate meters. Yeah, you know, do you are you allowed to have a joint meter for multiple units on? You know, do you have the, the single family home and the ADU and the JADU? Can they all plug into one power source, one meter? Are you required to have separate meters? I believe we usually require separate meters um, for ADUs, but perhaps not for JADUs. Um, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But we can look into that and get that clarity to you when we come back um, and provide a recommendation for, for tiny homes as well. And good fences make good neighbors, and so do separate meters. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. It's ownership. I think. I'd like to jump in on this one. Um, I definitely, yes. I definitely support no short-term rentals, um, uh, not allowing them. And in terms of ownership and occupancy, um, I think it depends on the discussion with the assessor's office, it seems like at that point, we'll be able to make a better decision. Well, I, I think if we have a lot of tiny homes, then yes, I agree with a couple of people who spoke up. We have to figure out what the mechanism for them to pay their, um, their requisite part, I'll bet much smaller, of maintaining roads, schools, parks, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody, I don't think the community is going to support supported otherwise. Um, yeah. And I, I, I and I would be very much against short-term rentals. I, I'm not sure any of us is for that. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, no, I agree with I agree with both uh, Commissioner Schaefer Freitas and Commissioner Shepherd. Any other comments on that or on the permitting? Um, as far as permitting, um, right in the first paragraph, it says, um, in Placer County, in Placer County, where there's a high fire risk, many members raise concerns that tiny units should be held to the same fire safety standards as stick built homes, which led staff to add a standard for fire suppression construction in high fire hazard areas. Um, I'd like, seems like a good idea to me. I wondered what the other commissioners thought because we certainly are in a high fire hazard area. Again, this is another example where rural concerns may differ from urban concerns. So for the rural areas, this is an issue. Yeah, I mean, I think that I um, agree how the staff recommendation um, um, words that and I'm I'm good with that. That they're they're going to require. The suggestion was to require um, different standards if it's in a high extra yeah. fire hazard zone. I'd agree with that, and I think you know that's the the wooey the wild wildland urban interface comes in town like quite a ways, and that really you know is often overlooked at planning stage and really kicks in at building department where you're trying to go put siding on your building and you have to use something that's fire rated. So I think it'd be really important to clarify that, which was you know, done here. I think it's important to clarify what materials are gonna be allowed uh, at an early stage so that there's no confusion and someone doesn't just go build one of these things thinking it's gonna work and then turns out they couldn't use cedar siding that's not treated, they have to use hardy plank, you know what I mean? Um, let's see, I think we had a couple of 
sensor. This is where we kind of talked about the permitting um, renewals every five years. Am I right on that? Okay. Is that something that we want to address? Does five years seem appropriate? Is there someone mentioned maybe a little bit sooner in my mind? I thought it'd be a little bit sooner if I was just kind of guessing, at least on a first round to just. Yeah, I agree. It might be good to have years. it be a shorter interval, at least to start. Once we've got everything running like syrup, then we can make it longer term. So I would say two or three years for the first 10 years or five years and then see how it works out. I don't know what other commissioners think. It seems no. like we have to refine it. Just like the cannabis ordinance seems to come back frequently because it needs adjustment. That was a big change. This may just need a reality check more frequently at first. Hell, we, we uh, review the quarries every 10 years. So, you know, I would be for, I'll just name a number, three, for the first 10 years. Commissioner Lazenby, did you want to speak up? Yes, I was, um, I was struck by this provision because if you require that this um, tiny home or uh, tiny home on wheels or foundation, be inspected for mostly maintenance upkeep is, is my understanding. But what are they doing about the primary residence? We don't have any requirements that you have to come out and check that eyesore. <laughs> if it is. I... <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Um, you know, we only uh, would, would come out to a primary residence to address a uh, public nuisance issue if we got a code complaint from a neighbor. So your other jurisdictions have varying amounts of time between inspections. What did you find out? You know, I didn't, I didn't see this in other jurisdiction ordinances, actually. This, this idea of um, concern about maintenance and upkeep of the tiny home on wheels and a permit renewal requirement really came from the community meetings that we held. Um, uh, so it would be something that we would be uh, putting into our ordinance that would be a little bit different um, from what I've seen in other jurisdictions. I'm going to see it as an opportunity to learn as much as to check in. You know, it's um, right. be good to get out and say, hey, how's the thing going as the septic challenge that whatever however that turns out like is that working for you is it not can we adjust like it, it's a good way to get some feedback as well as just you know this is a new building type that you know could potentially be easily I mean modifiable just like anything else it just it just feels because like it's new we might want to check in on it yeah and there but, may be new technology we want to include based on what we find out. I think I agree. It would be good for information gathering and modification is necessary. Do we have a rental like, um, inspection? I know the city does. I don't think no, the county doesn't have that. So it's true that someone would have to pay for it. <clears throat> yeah, that's that was my question too. Is, is it going to cost money to the, to the homeowner for this check-in? Or is Probably. it going to be? I believe the permit renewal usually does. Um, and Something I just think to look at, at least maybe Daisy can just look at it and figure what it would include. Could it be a checkoff? Could it be a form? Um, could it be a questionnaire that really we really want you to complete? Um, is if there's any complaints from the neighborhood? Every time we've done a new ordinance of, with a substantial new cast, we've certainly allowed for feedback. I think it's a at least initially for some years, I think it'd be good. Can we figure out a low cost way and not cost the homeowner an arm and a leg? Um, okay. Separate topic on, on this one is, is fees. What do we, do we expect there to be fees like there would be on a single family home? This might need further thought. Um, school fees, you know, all that, all that stuff. How does that play in? Well, that comes back to the taxing issue. Mm -hmm. And these units probably have to pay their way for 
the community. But I think that, so one of the things I was thinking about is if that's not possible for whatever reason, the assessor comes back and says, no, until the state changes their laws, we can't do anything. Then I think if that's the case, if that's a conversation that you have with the assessor, then you might wanna come back with us to us with some other ideas that would have some sort of fee associated to, um, to fund those services. Yeah, and then um, just in regards to fees, sort of generally, um, we would assess a fee, or we would we would um, charge a fee for the permit process, the kind of ministerial permit process that I laid out. Um, but that would certainly be different from our usual building permit fee, um, and we staff can kind of uh, think more about how that might be structured um, and come back to the commission with that those thoughts just a suggestion i guess if it's like an adu under 640 square feet i think the fees are reduced right so if we're following adu standards that might be something to consider but then if you're using it as a single family home and you group together four of these and you know that's and if that becomes something that's allowed that would be a different scenario right where it would live like a single family home uh, i think Grouping them, one's a kitchen, one's a bedroom, and so on. That has so many issues around it. Maybe that can be something to be looked at in this further study of larger groups. I, I, I would not. That doesn't appeal to me in this first round. Too complicated. Too many things can go wrong. Let's put that one off. That, that sounds like a camp, not... <laughs> It sounds yeah. like a fun camp, but it's still a camp, so different conditions apply. I think it's it's not probably wouldn't be a very common situation either because you would need a vacant parcel, right? Mm -hmm. um, it probably would be in a rural area, right? Yeah. Kind of like a gypsy caravan so situation. I guess I don't know. This is a heavy lift for staff, and I guess I want to also be mindful of what we're asking staff, and and I want to do this in a timely manner um, in a, even a quicker <laughs> um, path or in a certain area. So I guess I don't want, I wouldn't want the um, staff to get bogged down studying something that's more complex than this already is. But but I, I mean, I'm open to it. I just feel like it, it needs a little bit more flushing out. Um, so I, I wouldn't want it to hold, hold this up. Yeah, I propose that we add that concept to the tiny home village concept which we studied separately i agree that if it definitely if it's something that's going to bog it down right now i don't think that it's it's more important to get this thing done um i just want want to know when it would be coming back commissioner lazenby go ahead if you had three or four of these units that are minimum of 150 square feet wouldn't you far exceed the 400 square feet of a tiny home? Well, these are all, that's a good question. I mean, I think like this is, that's exactly a reason why it would bring up a whole host of other issues that are separate from what we're looking at right now, just at individual tiny homes. So, I mean, I guess that that's kind of more reason to do it separately in a way. So I think our direction is to consider that separately. Right. So let's see, um, I have to go soon. Um, so where are we now, Tim? Well, we're, we're on regulations still. I think the last thing that just, I know we've talked about, but I just wanna clarify that whatever the process is going to be to get these permitted should be really clear for the community. Sometimes that's hard to do, as we kind of noted maybe in the last um, agenda item that the, it's it's, the community needs a better way to find this than to look up code. It's not always the easiest path. So, you know, some sort of visual, here's what you can do, would be. Well, I think, I think the county's done a, a really good job on promoting information to AUDs. Yes. Agreed. So uh, if we yeah. did something similar, that would be, a, a, you know, that's a good program. ADUs, I said it set differently. Yep. <laughs> All right, if anyone had anything else on that, 
Oh, I'm sorry, I was on permitting. Now we're on to structure of regulations, I suppose. Um, so if it's appropriate now, maybe I can throw out um, what I was thinking about with the burn area and see what staff thinks. Um, so, so first of all, I think, you know, Pio weighed in that our code does allow, and you, you outlined pretty clearly in your staff report, our code outlines that if you, that you can have an RV or a tiny home on wheels while you're um, rebuilding, um, but that's a temporary permit. So I guess the distinction here is um, that that might not be good enough for some people and they want something more permanent um, from what I've heard. So, um, so if that's the case, then would it be possible to separate out the burn area and try to do an expedited process to allow for tiny homes on wheels in the burn area? And then kind of, you know, like, I, I don't know how is, I'm not sure I was gonna ask how quickly that could, that could be effectuated, even if it has to be separated out from all the other areas. And not that I wanna hold up the other areas, but I do feel, you know, if people are really, this is, this is a product that the, burn, the fire survivors are needing, I would like to try to get something as quickly as possible. I think we should just basically direct staff to, I would agree to do it in that, to look at the development of an ordinance in, in that order, the burn area first. But, you know, some of these questions that still need to be resolved um, are, are, are pertinent to the burn area, like about mm -hmm. utilities. There's no way around that that's gonna take a little while. Would it be, appropriate. I agree with both of those things. It becomes challenging because that's like the biggest hiccup for the burn areas, right? Is the utilities and the septic. Okay. What is the, the ordinance right now allows this temporarily, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm on full agreement to push it forward as fast as possible. I'm just kind of thinking through it here out loud that that was a three-year term, term. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And it's renewable, right? Isn't is it renewable? Um, I think Paya may be able to weigh in on that. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to help on the burn area questions. Um, they are for an initial period of three years, and explicitly it's stated that they can be renewed in intervals of one year. Um, the thing to remember, I think, when we think about doing permanent temporary homes on, temporary homes on wheels in the burn area is that uh, what we've been doing so far is predicated on there being temporary. So... Um, and it also assumes that there was a legal dwelling on the parcel. So if you're in the burn area, but you're not a burn victim and you had a vacant parcel, for example, this mm -hmm. was not an opportunity to bring on um, a temporary home on wheels. So what that was doing was creating a path for people to get situated post-disaster. And then for anything permanent, it would be pending a, an ordinance like the one you, you are you know, shaping today. Um, you know, so I wonder if really the question that's being brought up um, by Commissioner Dan is that we need an expanded piece of emergency response in the CZU area, which is allowing permanent temporary homes on wheels with a different level of regulation or, um, you know, with accommodation because it's the burn area. And so we have up until now, um, uh, drawn a line or a distinction between temporary and permanent because we have um, not required some of these issues to be solved for the temporary ones. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, there's a way to um, not do a geologic report. You know, if if one is would normally be required for the setting in which you want to put a temporary home because it's temporary, there's there's a, a way not to deal with that. Um, we do not require a, um, a fire clearance in order to do a temporary home on wheels. Uh, um, if you're rebuilding your permanent house, the fire agency needs to weigh in and say the access is adequate, but we don't require that for a temporary situation. So we'd, we'd have to kind of grapple, I think, with the issues anyway um, to extend that to permanent, unless we just want it to be part of an emergency response that you get to do something permanent, um, 
and I think the board would have to take that decision and maybe we could do it as an urgency ordinance, but it's a whole different path, I think. Um, so I guess I have a follow-up then. So what, so it sounds like you can, so if you are a fire survivor and you're, um, you want to be back on your property, you, you can, you can do this. You can have a tiny home. You can't. And so maybe, but what I was thinking of might be more difficult, actually. The temporary permit sounds a lot simpler than yes. even the simplest version of what we're considering here. So it might not even be helpful. Yeah, um, I think the temporary program kind of solves the need. It's just that people need to know they can do it. And I think um, somebody, one of the commissioners stated this, and I think it's right. Um, even though you can do temporary and there is all kinds of accommodation within that, people still have to show that they have um, um, septic and water. And I think the people who've had a hard time getting a temporary permit are the ones who did not have legal structures to begin with. So, um, so we have issued a bunch of these temporary ones and we'll keep doing it. And it is easier than anything you're contemplating. Okay, well then I'm maybe, what I was thinking of is not necessary then. But y your concept is heard loud and clear, which is how can we focus this in a manner that helps the burn people? Okay. I'm good with that too. Yeah. Thank you, Fire. Certainly. So maybe, you know, our direction is not necessarily to bifurcate it unless for some reason that became more optimal. Um, for the CZU victims? I think you know, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I think he is, now that she's explained the temporary program, it sounds like staff has already moved to do the best job they can. I'm, I'm glad of that. And yes, the problems of dealing with people who didn't have a legal dwelling before, that's a separate issue. And I don't want to get into that here at this stage. But just to point out that it, that that is a way in which the ordinance you're working on today will will help burn area people is those that did not have permitted dwellings can now come in for a permitted tiny home on wheels. Um, so it, it does create a new option for those folks. Right. And the reality is those areas are probably the hardest to get through anyway. So separating them out, it's not going to really benefit much. Okay, that makes sense. Bye. Um, one note I might just add on bifurcation is um, what staff had been recommending um, in their staff report was to bifurcate um, the adoption of the ordinance inside and outside the coastal zone. Um, and staff would probably still recommend that just based on the fact that, um, you know, Inside the coastal zone, we require coastal commission um, certification of ordinances, and sometimes that can take a long, a long time. Um, whereas outside the coastal zone, the ordinance becomes, you know, in effect after the board approves it. So that might be something that the commission may want to consider um, allowing, as it would also benefit um, people in the, the majority of the CZU burn area. I think I think we all agreed with you on that. But again, I think the ordinance itself needs to have provisions for rural and urban areas as appropriate, not just one ordinance for outside coastal zone. Agreed. Uh, hey. uh, moving on from that point, then it seems like we're all in agreement on that. Um, the I wanted to just want to ask, ask one follow-up question on the timing section. We mentioned that we would potentially check in with people that have built these within three years, let's say. Is there a separate timing um, code adjustment period that we're going to look at, like come back to this code within two years to make sure that it's working? Or is it kind of, that, are those two hand in hand? I, I, I would think that we should pose that back to staff the next time we look at this, see what they can check what any other jurisdiction is doing. If not, they can discuss what makes the most sense from, we told them our why we would want to check back in and let them develop that and come back to us with it. Okay. 
Hey, uh, any other comments, questions, thoughts? Good job here. <laughs> Exciting. Job. Yeah. Exciting. I do have something, um, please. Chair, um, I just wanted to get clarification from staff on um, what their approach is going to be to coastal zone areas and are they planning to meet with Coastal Commission staff? As, as many of you know, I represent uh, neighborhoods such as um, Rio Del Mar and Seacliff that are heavily impacted by tourists and parking and narrow streets. And um, I wanna make sure that we have protections for those areas. So my question is, are you planning to develop this further and talk to coastal staff? Yes, um, yeah, so on this particular topic, we haven't coordinated much with coastal staff yet, although they are aware that we're starting development of this ordinance and that will be on the list um, as we move forward um, to coordinate closely with coastal staff. Um, the one um, difference that I know that we are considering for some coastal zone areas would be parking. Mm -hmm. um, and what staff was proposing is that we would have the same requirements that we have for ADUs, which is special parking requirements in the uh, uh, Live Oak, Seacliff uh, Aptos, La Selva Beach, and Davenport designated areas. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that that would be the path we would probably start start on um, okay. with conversation with Coastal, um, and and go from from there. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll, I'll wait to hear more. Yeah, and then there's also the question of how the coastal development permits would work, and it's a little right. bit different because these aren't right. buildings. Right. Um, so we'd have to kind of work work that out as well with coastal okay. staff. And I just wanted to chime in with everybody else that it was an excellent presentation, and all of your hours of work on this clearly showed through. So thank you for your patience and doing this. Yeah, and I want to say thank you for taking with considerable effort to find out what other communities are doing. Too yes. often we act like we exist and there's nobody else. This right. was really helpful. And I think learning what other counties and areas have done is actually informative. And I guess my final content comment is, when we do residential development, the biggest complaint of most people is about adding off-street parking and they can't get through and it's too crowded. And so the parking issues are gonna be important to look at. Um, for the whole ordinance, that's, that's going to be a consideration. So, anyway, I, I think it's. I, I thought it was a, a very good effort. It was really good to see what other people are doing because we don't want to. We don't. We're not inventing the wheel, although it feels like it. <laughs> yeah, I also wanted to comment that the public outreach was really well done, and I thought that was an important part. And it was, you know, I know it pushed our timeline out a little bit, but it's good to get people a little bit more involved before it came to us so that they could get their questions answered. And I thought that was really helpful for this in particular meeting. Yeah, I think um, um, I think the outreach was excellent, but I think as we move along, we have to make an, an effort to draw in more of the community um, than advocates. And the more of the community needs to be accepting of this and needs to know what's planned. Right. Specifically those in the CZU, fire areas, it'd be, I'm, I'm assuming that most of them are probably on these meetings or calls or, you know, but it'd be really important, I think, if possible to reach out to anyone who does have a permit for a temporary structure and just make sure they have this information. It will, you know, and anyone who's applying, you know, if they can use an RV today, but they can't when this ha when this gets approved, we just gotta, you know, it'd be beneficial to let them know as soon as possible so they don't, you know, so they know what to expect. Okay, so I think we have a lot of, we've created a lot of recommendations. I believe we need to vote on those recommendations. Is that correct? This is just a study session. Yeah. So no vote. No, it's it's right. Right. Yeah. We're done. Good, I and, like it. And I, I, I'd like to suggest we have another study session as you move this along. We, we continue to be interactive with staff. Um. When so you staff, bring, oh, sorry, go ahead. I apologize, go ahead, you're about to. Uh, I was just gonna say staff's recommendation was to bring back a uh, draft ordinance uh, next. Um, and that is the direction from the Board of Supervisors. 
um, from March of 2021. Um, so I just want to kind of keep that in in mind. Um, that you know, it's it's rare that we would have two study sessions for a project that's not you know larger. So so if the, if the commission would like to hold more than one study session, we can certainly discuss that. Um, that would be a little bit out of the ordinary. This is an out of the ordinary ordinance. Well, my, why don't we do this? Um, why don't we see what comes back in the ordinance? And then we have oftentimes when we've had a draft ordinance um, taken more than one meeting to get, get that right. So we can almost treat the meeting where we see the draft ordinance in front of us as a study session if necessary. For me, it'd be helpful to see what's being proposed in black and white. Like the ordinance is where the rubber meets the road. And so otherwise it's just kind of all talk and in concept. So I actually think it would be helpful to have something proposed that we could then, you know, discuss and change and whatnot. Well, you know, it's really what it doesn't matter what it's called. I just think we need to have plenty of time to interact with this. Definitely. Okay, with that then, we can close item number eight officially. Thank you, Daisy. <laughs> Thank you so Great much. Great job, Daisy. Yeah. All okay, right. Um, agenda item number nine, planning directors to report. Do we have anything to report today? Is Paya still with us? Yeah, um, I'll be super brief. <clears throat> First thing is, um, thank you for recognizing Daisy and staff's work on this. She's super detailed and really great with the public. So I'm glad that you all um, see that. Um, brief update, um, the schedule is starting to firm up for bringing the sustainability update, uh, general plan update package uh, forward. And we do expect to release that um, at the end of this month. And uh, you have one more meeting before that on 223, so we can discuss the details of the schedule with you at that time. And that concludes my report. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Um, okay, item 10, report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas. Um, yes. We, uh, so the next regularly scheduled meeting date is February 23rd, and we have one item uh, on the agenda so far, which is going to be an appeal of a project that was approved by the zoning administrator on Bonnie Street. Um, and then the next meeting after that is March 9th, and we do so far have one item tentatively scheduled for that meeting date, which is the wireless ordinance amendments. Um, and I don't know beyond then. So definitely meeting the next two meeting dates. And that's all I have. Thank you. I want to apologize. I didn't give anyone time to discuss item nine, the planning director's report. And I know that was probably a little bit of a complicated item. So I want to give that opportunity if anyone had any further questions for Paya. Uh, um, I'd like to request when we're, we're, when we met in person, we usually took a lunch break if things were going to go on. And on the other hand, when we're all at home, maybe it's not critical, but I'd like to suggest that when, if we discuss it, you know, and then we can have a consensus one way or the other, because we are asking staff to go through their lunch here. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, I just want to bring that up. So, you know, if we're in a hearing, we've got a big agenda, either we take a lunch break or we don't, but let's let's discuss it each time instead of just going on, if that's okay. That's great. What was, what's kind of a typical process there? So I can know for the next. I think, I think when it looked like it was coming up that we were definitely not done, um, either staff or the chair could say, well, can everybody stay through this or do we prefer to take an hour lunch break and come back? And then everyone would say what was best for them. I'm glad you brought that up, Renee. And actually, Tim, I can email you. Judy and I, when she was the chair, we had an agreement to check in with each other at a certain point in time. And I think it was at 1130. We took a 10 minute break around that then 
for this meeting. So it kind of threw us off on the lunch break a little bit. Um, but I will check in with you, Tim, about that. Um, and we can develop a little bit more of a protocol. We do, we should be taking a lunch break also for the purpose of allowing CTV staff to take a break um, because they have to be with us throughout the meeting if we don't take a break as well. So thank you, Renee, for that. And um, I will follow up with you. Um, sorry, Chair Gordon, um, after the meeting and, and we can we can make it more of a protocol. Yeah, we usually would check in. I mean, sometimes we take a half an hour lunch break, um, but at least we can talk about it. And then we usually took a 10 minute break during the morning session. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we should resume doing that. Okay. It's a good, always a good idea. Just because we're home, I don't think that changes things. I need to get up and clear my mind, just especially with weighty issues. And I'm thinking of staff too. This is a long time. To be a total yeah. alert. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That was good. <clears throat> um, and there's no other thoughts on those two items. Uh, uh, last item on the agenda, county council's report. Yes, just uh, nothing to report. Thank you all for the spirited discussion. I learned a lot. And uh, I will be in touch with staff about uh, this draft ordinance. And it's great to be back with you all. Good job, Tim. Welcome back. Thank you. I was just going to say this issue of breaks and lunch just didn't matter for the longest time because we didn't we we always finished at noon. It's not because we're changing chairs. I just it's just starting to come up. That's all. Okay. I think there was only one time last year where we went past. That, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that. Hey, great. Well, we're there. We made it. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appearing for today. So, thank you, everyone. Have a good okay. day. Thanks, Jocelyn.